nobody wants to be alone at the end of the world. I was on the outskirts of the city, surrounded by hundreds of people, but it definitely wasn't as comforting as it sounds. I was also in a prison cell. The hundreds of people were all heartless guards, a few dozen other workers, and then fellow inmates as desolate as me or almost as dangerous as the threats about to hit us. Everything started during an ironically peaceful night. The cells around me were all quiet, and I had a perfect view of the moon from a small window in the back wall of my cell. I was used to serving my time patiently, and with resignation, I had accepted my penance. I was there because of a drunk driving incident that resulted in the death of an innocent woman. I would carry that guilt forever, but I never tried to make excuses for myself and so I had no anger in me to direct at my situation. I was pretty much a ghost with no purpose. Until that night. The full moon was bright on the dark sky speckled with stars. I was mesmerized. It was the most beautiful sight I had seen in a while. Then, there was that light. It was as if someone was pointing a flashlight directly at the moon. I lost sight of the stars. The moon changed color to a deep and unnatural silver. And then, for just a second, so quick that if I had blinked at that moment I would have completely missed it. The moon was illuminated by a fiery orange colour. For one instant, the moon looked like it was set on fire. The next second, the moon had completely and absolutely disappeared from the sky. I stayed by the window for a few minutes trying to understand what had happened and waiting for the moon to show up again. But no such luck. No stars. No moon. Nothing. Everything beyond my window darkened considerably. But what could I have done? I was locked in that cell. I didn't even have a cellmate at that time. I convinced myself that it must have just been a meteorological phenomenon that I didn't understand. Perhaps it was a special event, an extraordinary eclipse that everyone in the world had been looking forward to, and I was just among the disgraced people unconnected from society that didn't know about it. And I was just lucky enough to catch it at the right time. Either way, I went to sleep with a trace of anxiety in my chest, but, to be honest, that wasn't unusual while living in prison. The real unusual thing started the next day, if I could even call it that. I was startled awake by the guards waking us all up. I was deeply confused and expected some kind of emergency, believing that they were waking us up in the middle of the night, but that wasn't the case. The lights were turned on to make up for the fact that there was pretty much no light coming from the windows. It was six in the morning and still pitch black as if it were midnight. This wasn't your regular cloudy day. In fact, there were no signs of clouds at all, let alone the sun. This was something different, something strange and ominous. Still, our day tried to go on as usual, breakfast in the dining hall, then working on our assigned tasks until lunch, working for a few more hours, then a brief period of free time in the courtyard, dinner, special activities like religious services, therapy, medical revisions, and then back to sleep. But that day, everything started to change. Everyone in the prison noticed the sun hadn't come up. 
The strange, homogenous darkness in the sky was impossible to miss and very hard to accept as something normal. People were asking too many questions. Some inmates started getting rowdy. The less emotionally stable ones were becoming a problem. During lunch, the warden of the prison was forced to make a speech. Attention everyone, he said and the guards had to intervene in the dining hall to make everyone listen. I'm sure you all have noticed the peculiar weather conditions we're dealing with today. It's nothing you should worry about, and nothing you can complain about. So, I suggest all of you do your best to ignore it and go on with your day. Any disturbance will be dealt with accordingly. We'll be back to normal tomorrow. Thank you. Have a good night. D day. Have a good day. Here's the thing. If the warden thought his speech would be reassuring and listened to by everyone in the prison, he was dead wrong. Not everyone was as apathetic as me. During the afternoon, the power went out. Our prison used solar panels for energy, but the batteries had run out and they hadn't been able to recharge since the previous day. This meant that by the time we had our off-duty period in the courtyard, almost everyone was keyed up and getting aggressive. The inmates were demanding answers and not believing a word when the guards swore they had no idea why the sky was black as coal. People tried to take advantage of the lack of illumination and fights started to break out all over the courtyard. Eventually, and unsurprisingly, the warden decided to cut our day short and send everyone back to their cells. Being locked up again only made things worse though. We were in for a long night, quite the opposite of what we needed. One inmate that screamed about the imminent apocalypse inspired another one to cry out about conspiracy theories, which made a few more yell at them to shut up, and in a matter of minutes, we were a pathetic circus. Loud, angry, and confused. It was one of the worst nights I had experienced in that place. I couldn't wait for it to be over. The next day, well, it felt wrong to call it the next day. There was no day to speak of. A few hours had passed and the guards woke us up at the same time as usual, or so we chose to believe. But when I jumped out of bed to look out the window, nothing had changed. It looked just as it did when I saw the moon disappear. No sun. No clouds. Nothing. The world was dark, lifeless and unrecognisable. I wasn't sure if it was darker or if it was my eyes playing tricks on me, but I could be certain of one thing. It was getting colder. Not too much yet, but there was a noticeable change from the previous days. That day, or well, those next few hours, were full of nothing but changes. There were fewer guards, and the ones left were simultaneously more strict and more distracted than usual. They kept checking the watches on their wrists, pulling out their phones and losing their patience at the smallest disturbance, and there were plenty of those. Everyone psychologically unstable was worse than ever. But even the most reasonable people in the prison were demanding answers, defying the guards and fighting back. After all, I couldn't have been the only one that noticed the sudden lack of guards around the prison. On top of everything else going on, we were still without power. No lights, no computers, phones dying halfway through the shift of the regular staff and failures in the security system. I'd signed up to work in the kitchens of the prison, so I saw firsthand how some of the food started going bad after more than 24 hours in a fridge that didn't work. 
a lot of stuff was frozen. But how long could it last? And the fresh vegetables and supplies that arrived every morning hadn't shown up since the incident. We wouldn't last long like this. We weren't among the best equipped prisons in the country, but I knew for a fact that there were others that had to be doing much worse than us. Life like this was unsustainable. That day, there were more altercations and conflicts than I'd seen in all my months in prison put together. Everyone was hypersensitive and ready to fight back at the smallest temptation. The lack of sun made everyone look darker, crueler, and a little less human. It was a miracle that I had managed to stay out of most fights. Our activities got cancelled even earlier that day, and I returned to my cell exhausted, but with only a few scratches on me. I was so done with this strange new routine, and it was the first time in a long time that I felt violently frustrated by being in prison. Guilt and depression had tricked me into accepting my new life. But this was something else. This was going to drive me mad. I was desperate to do something, to be useful, to fight back. I was in the middle of those thoughts, completely detached from what time of the day it could possibly be when I heard a strange noise. It came from the outside and it was louder than anything I had ever heard. It was as if a jet was flying right next to my ear. I ran toward the window, but I couldn't see anything. The prison came alive. People started to scream in fright or hope. I couldn't know for certain. And then the night sky was illuminated for one blissful second. Everyone was washed in an orange glow, and I thought, this is it! We're going to be free! A miracle happened! But just as swiftly as it came, the light disappeared all over again. We were thrown back into that soulless gloom. I didn't know what had happened exactly. But I was smart enough to imagine missiles flying through the sky to attack a threat and failing in their mission. I fell asleep disheartened and hopeless. I told myself that I wouldn't be surprised when they woke us up again and the shadows outside were still firmly in place. And yet, the call from the guards shocked me profoundly. It was mostly due to the fact that it came accompanied by the sound of keys on the lock of my door. They were opening up my cell. What's this? I wondered, stumbling out of bed and still half asleep. What's going on? Mercy, the warden answered. Mercy. I echoed the word, feeling its glorious taste on my tongue. But I was dumbfounded. This didn't make sense. This never happened. I was standing at the open door of my cell, watching as a group of guards escorted the warden along the hallway, opening one door after the other, letting almost everyone out. Mercy? For me? For everyone? I asked, chasing after the warden. One of the guards pushed me so I wouldn't get too close, but nothing more than that. For everyone that won't make things even more difficult for the rest of the world outside. There was nothing I could answer. All I could do was follow the warden, like everyone else, until we found ourselves in the courtyard of the prison. Not everyone was outside, but there were dozens of us, maybe a little more than a hundred. It was the strangest sight to see everyone mingling like that from all the sectors of the prison, Men and women of all kinds. Well, everyone that wouldn't be a problem to the rest of the world, like the warden said. I guessed that meant everyone locked up for minor crimes. This could be noticed by the calm that reigned over us, even though the number of guards was even lower than the day before. Surely they had better places to be in these strange times. 
Though maybe we were all so peaceful due to the fact that we were all intrigued and also exhausted. I didn't even know for sure if they woke us up in the middle of the night for this or if it was early morning. I guessed it didn't matter anymore. It was all the same. One endless night of confusion and fear. All right, everyone. Listen up. This is important news and I won't be repeating myself, the warden said. And just like clockwork, everyone seemed to lean in closer to hear him better. You don't need me to tell you that there's something very wrong with the sky above us. You can see it, he said. Again, as if we shared the same mind, we all looked up at the pitch black sky above us. I wasn't the only one that shivered at the sight. The lack of clouds, sun, moon or stars was unnerving, to say the least. You might want an explanation, but the full truth is that I don't have it. The warden continued talking. Something, we don't know what, came out of nowhere and blocked our entire planet from the sun. We don't know what it is, why it is here, when it is going to leave or how to get rid of it. The government isn't saying any more than that. Now, you can't believe they don't want to say more or that they truly don't know more. Whatever you find most reassuring. Either way, they're telling everyone to keep calm, but they also started firing missiles at the sky, and that didn't work, so maybe it really is time to be afraid. Maybe it is time to cling to your loved ones, hope for the best, and prepare for the worst. So, go, get out of here, do what you have to do before we run out of time. For one blissful second, nobody reacted and nobody moved. Of course, we couldn't believe it. Freedom, given to us just like that. So easily, but with the bittersweet taste of knowing we were free only because people were starting to fear that, what, that the world was ending? It almost felt like a joke. Then we all heard at once the sound of the guards opening the gates of the courtyard, the ones that led to a driveway and out of the prison. That was when all hell broke loose. Half of the people ran towards the gates, pushing each other with everything they had in order to be the first ones, scared of this actually being a joke or the warden suddenly changing his mind. As if that wasn't chaos enough, I was surprised to see some people doing the exact opposite. If I hadn't been close enough to the makeshift stage where the warden was, then I wouldn't have understood what these people were doing. No! No! What the hell are you doing? I heard the warden exclaim as the guards tried to keep people from throwing themselves at his feet. No! I don't care about what your religion told you. I don't care if it's the apocalypse. Get away from me! He went on, trying to move away from the small crowd begging at him. This is not a doomsday bunker, this is a prison. Don't you want to leave? Don't you want your freedom? I couldn't stay to listen to any more of that. Maybe they had a point. The prison did look like a very safe building to hide in if the world was ending, but I had better places to be, regardless of the level of security on it. The initial shock was over, and the first wave of frantic inmates was out of the gates, I was able to limp forward along with the rest of them, slowly at first, stumbling against each other, brushing our shoulders and repeatedly looking back. The sun should have been shining and we should have been laughing, dancing and squinting against the blinding sunlight that welcomed us as we escaped our bleak confinement. But there was none of that. The outside was every bit as dark and depressing as the inside of the prison, if not more. Still, we were outside. We were free. That much was undeniable. 
Little by little, we were all infected by the wild excitement of our peers. Our slow steps got faster and faster, and soon enough, all of us were running, running as fast as we could, some of us laughing, most of us crying, everyone looking forward to everything that could be waiting for us. Freedom at last. There was no riding off into the sunsets, of course, not with the complete absence of the sun. But if this had been a movie, that would have been the happy ending. And then, the rain came. It was only a few drops at first, just enough so the handful of us that noticed it slowed down. But then it fell on us all at once. It was a downpour, nothing gentle or gradual about it. The skies, whatever they had turned into, opened up and a storm attacked the ex-inmates just minutes after our first taste of freedom. The storm was merciless, the worst I had ever seen. The cold raindrops fell on us like needles and the temperature dropped drastically, leaving us shivering in our drenched clothes. There was a long stretch of empty land between the prison and the city and in a matter of minutes it turned into a muddy nightmare, a swamp where all of us stumbled, fell, dragged ourselves over our hands and knees, anything to get back home. I wasn't sure how much time passed, I was seeing fewer people around me, but then something changed in the sky above us, something much different and deadlier than the rain started to fall down. Through the roaring of the storm, I heard everyone around me start screaming in horror. I looked up and saw them. It looked like countless missiles raining down on us from the black sky. All the ex-inmates that escaped the prison with me screamed and ran away aimlessly trying to hide from the upcoming doom. I imitated everyone else. I threw myself to the ground, just a few meters from the spot where one of the missiles landed. And that was it. They landed on the ground. They didn't explode. There was no final blast that destroyed our world forever. Nothing like that. Cautiously, all of us raised our heads from the ground, looking at each other and then fearfully glanced at whatever it was that fell from the sky. The answer wasn't obvious. Aliens? Robots? Machines? A combination of each? We didn't have time to figure it out. The things that fell from our darkened sky were about 20 feet tall. They stood on a pair of metallic legs, thin, but with sharp ends which reminded me of an insect. At the top of the legs, there seemed to be a small cabin, a metal box with mysterious insides. At the very top of the strange apparatus, there was a sort of antenna with a bright red spot at the top. From each of those boxes, a pair of flashlights illuminated the area in front of them. It was a relief to see some kind of light in the middle of that perpetual dusk. Until we were forced to understand that the flashlights were actually the equivalent of a sniper's vision. All the machines started shooting at us at the same time. The rain hadn't even stopped and we were under a brand new storm. The sound was deafening. The fire the screams, the rattling of the giant machines stepping forward. They weren't missiles, they didn't come from Earth, and they were invading us without mercy. There was very little strategy. The machines were shooting anything that moved and it was pure chaos. Our chances of survival lowered with each passing second, but our panic increased beyond reason. The adrenaline pushed us forward against all the odds. I got off the floor and started running with everything I had. My legs ached and my lungs were burning, but I never stopped, hesitated or looked back. I stumbled every few meters, slipping on the mud or crashing against a dead body, but I always got back up. 
out of the hundreds that were freed from the prison. I guess that maybe a dozen of us reached the city. It was a massacre unlike anything I had ever witnessed. And it was far from over. Those unexplainable machines fell all over the city too. They were patrolling the streets, aiming their lights at the building's windows and shooting everything that made a single move. When I reached the city, I felt my heart break in my chest. This wasn't the meteorological phenomenon I imagined on the first day. This was the end of the world. The city was in shambles. The rain hadn't stopped, but even that wasn't enough to put out the fires all over the city. Buildings burning, collapsing and turning to ashes in front of me. Abandoned cars, dead bodies on the streets and little children crying in dark alleyways. And I was just another one of them. I reached the outskirts of the city, the industrial area, and I managed to hide between two big rubbish containers. The smell was disgusting and the rain had made a mess of it all. I was probably lying in a pool of rubbish from all the past week, but I welcomed the momentary feeling of safety. I was shaking so much as a result of the fear the absurd cold, my wet clothes and the open wounds on my hands and knees from all the times I fell before I got there. There were many blood stains on my trousers, but I assumed most of the blood wasn't mine, but of all the corpses I stumbled with. Seeing my current conditions and having, for the first time in God knows how many hours, a moment to think, I simply broke down crying. I cried for the safety of the prison I left behind, of all the people just like me that died on the way here, for all the innocents on the streets, and for our doomed planet. I fell asleep among the rubbish, and the only mercy I had was that I slept like a log. It made sense, considering how exhausted I was after running for my life the entire way from the prison back to the city. I woke up shivering though, and my first rational thought was wondering how much more and how much faster the temperature would drop before we couldn't take it anymore. I desperately missed the warmth of the sun. I thought being locked up in prison was bad, but this was unlike anything I had ever imagined. My growling stomach fully woke me up and made me realize I couldn't exactly remember my last meal. I stood up slowly, with trembling legs and aching muscles. I accurately guessed that if the world fell apart, then the rubbish in these big containers hadn't been picked up in the last couple of days. At the very top of it, I managed to pick up recent enough scraps that I miraculously managed to keep down without throwing up at the awful scent. At least it would keep me alive. As if everything wasn't already dehumanizing enough, I convinced myself to dig through the rubbish just a little bit more, but at last I found what I had been searching for. A newspaper from the day after the eclipse. How much time had passed since then? A day? Two? Three? Four? I, I didn't even know. How long did I stay hiding in that dirty alleyway? I couldn't be certain. While reading... I learned a few facts that didn't really make things better. At least that first day, nobody still knew for sure what had blocked our view from the sun. The most popular theory was that a cloud of an unknown material from outer space was attracted by the gravity of our planet. It chased us like a moon and grew with every passing second, but it wasn't entirely solid. Of course, there were also people claiming we had angered the gods or that it was the work of the Russians, Chinese, the CIA, some small country in the Balkans, depending on where you read your news. The conclusion was clear. Nobody knew what it was or how to get rid of it. The governments wasted too much time blaming each other and if the situation continued, 
we could expect a global collapse. Well, that newspaper was clearly old. I was seeing the collapse all around me, and I'd wasted enough time. I needed to get home. I still had a mother and younger sister, or so I hoped. I walked slowly, cowering around the corners and waiting long minutes before taking any risk. The giant killing machines that fell from the sky were still patrolling the streets. Every other minute I could hear a new onslaught of projectiles fired from the machines at a poor soul that got caught moving on the deserted streets. My journey back home was excruciating, and so slow that I probably lost another day, even though days had lost all meaning. We only had this relentless night. I learned a lot about human nature on my way home. Most of the inmates died on the way here, and yet it was obvious that some of the most unspeakable crimes weren't even committed by the machines. I walked past bodies with their throats slid open, stabbed to death, and robbed of the clothes they wore. I had to hide from the machines as well as from other people more desperate and violent than me. But for the first time in a long time, I finally had a reason to keep moving forward. I wasn't the only one with a newfound motivation to fight. Despite the cruelty and despair in the streets, people were finding ways to survive and help each other. On every other corner of the street, I heard whispers. Groups of people hiding in the dark, exchanging pieces of food or blankets, softly opening the doors of their basements to hide complete strangers in the safety of their devastated homes. They were all connected, and I had to believe the future of our planet depended on them. But I couldn't join. This wasn't my world anymore. I just had to make sure I could help my mother and my sister. I was overwhelmed with fear, obviously. I thought I would get there too late, find my mother and sister already dead, killed by the machines, desperate robbers or any other tragic consequence of this infinite night. It didn't occur to me that I might arrive at the exact moment that my old house was caught under attack. I heard the sound of a machine shooting at a building, but I kept my hope until the very last second when I turned a corner and saw it clear as it was. Two sharp legs, 20 feet tall, a light aimed at the door of my house and an endless stream of projectiles hitting the front wall. Someone inside the house must have been caught looking out the window, but I had to hope they had ducked in time. But in time for what, I wondered. The machine could demolish that wall, like many others before, in just a few minutes more. They were doomed. And what could I do? That metallic monster of the night had already spotted them. Distracting it wouldn't be enough, but what else did I have? Even if I had a weapon, nothing could be done. I was just standing behind a building like the coward I had always been, but the building, it was three stories tall, taller than the enemy, and the stairs of the fire escape were right above me. Time moved in slow motion for me. Every step felt endless, and every second lasted a lifetime. I was more scared than ever before, but I finally reached the top of the building. The rain had stopped, and the scent of smoke and destruction lingered in the air. My entire body ached, but I used my last bit of strength to run as fast as I could toward the edge and then jump from the roof of the building. I was suspended in the air for one terrifying second and then crashed and landed atop the machine attacking my house. That cold metal was an excruciating place to land, but I made it. It was a suicide mission and I knew it very well, but the monster didn't even react. It ignored me right until the moment that I started yelling with all my repressed agony and I pulled at the red top of the antenna on it and forcibly tore it from the rest of the structure. It went out like a light bulb. Everything went still. I had discovered a way to stop them. 
As I tried to regain my breath, I felt a sudden light on me like a miracle. And I finally understood. Deactivating these monsters was the key. It would open the sky and give us back the sun. I basked on the light covering every inch of my body for one blissful second and then... I turned to see the other machine standing on the corner of the street. The one that was aiming its light at me. Fuck these alien machines, I thought, as it started blasting away at me. Hey, sci-fi horror fans, it's Thomas. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you'd like to become an official, official member of our channel, you can do so by clicking on the join, join button. Memberships start at only $5. Until next time, everyone, and remember, stay cosmic. It started as a delightful morning for me, if being woken up at 3 a.m. because of a pressure break in the Southwest Pipe Channel was pleasant. I briskly walked with the night guard on duty in this section, Miss Warnick. She had her flashlight, and I had my battery-powered lantern with a backpack of tools ready for any fixing. The glossy tied floor made the squeak of her slippers all the more unsettling. My backpack created an annoying clank as it bounced with each heavy step I took. I hope this didn't draw the attention of Warnick to my unsightly self, for I didn't get to dress myself the way I preferred. So, my shirt wasn't tucked in and it barely covered my big belly. Hopefully, she didn't notice. If she did, Miss Warnick didn't look around or comment about it. She was focused on what laid ahead of her. I never like walking through the compound at night, especially with the halls being so narrow for two people, much less for me. The five inch thick doors screeched worse than a monster's roar. Every part of the compound we lived in was self-contained, from the residential areas to the lunch and power units, but reliant upon the system and my expertise in maintaining it. I didn't have any specific title so anyone could call me a multitasker, because that was all I did. Lights flickered over us, and they needed to be replaced, but it was hard to get the scraps ever since our leader ordered a cease to venturing out some months ago. We navigated our way down the narrow halls, until we came on to the part where the pipes ran along the wall toward the fire room. There was a hissing sound that was louder than the occasional hisses through degraded metal, on a mental note, replace those. Warnick raised her flashlight over the collection of pipes. My eyes flicked about the pipe system and saw nothing strange. Can you see it, Renfro? Miss Warnick asked. I groaned in discontent because I was already tired. You said it alarmed back at the panel, right? She nodded her head and raised her eyebrows at the pipes. My lantern light dropped until I caught sight of it. There was a pipe near the ground that was ajar at the top, and it spewed steam in a light spray of water that I didn't want to touch unless I wanted bones for fingers. Found it, I said as I put on my heat-resistant gloves. As I pulled out my large, round saw to get to my screwdriver to open the control box and shut off this side of the pipeline, I noticed something. A mark against the floor was next to the pipe. I wasn't the only one, for Miss Warnick's flashlight moved closer as she leaned in and glared at that mark. She uttered to herself, uh, Is that? This pipe wasn't an accident, I said, even though the thought should have been left in my mind. I couldn't deny the way this pipe was knocked ajar. Something moved it. Her flashlight moved and at the edge of the light, a shadow retracted. My lips parted but I uttered no words. Miss Warnick turned with a whip of her head. Her eyes pierced the ground, but crackling thuds sent a chill up our spines. We were the only two people out here. We weren't moving, and as far as the rules, 
Everybody should be asleep in their quarters. Where was that sound coming from? Miss Warnick's free hand grabbed the pistol on her hip. My eyes moved around as I lifted my lantern. The light moved across the wall and I saw the inner pipes that sat within the wall. The long, decrepit arm of a mutant. The wires that curved along those pipes. The fasteners that tacked those wires to the... Hold on. My breath hitched as my shivering fingers fiddled with the cold metal handle of my lantern. I moved the lantern light back and I saw no arm. Okay, I definitely needed some sleep because I was imagining things. Miss Warnick grabbed my collar as the same arm flew at the back of my head. The loud bangs of that pistol emptied into that yellow-eyed mutant, a tiger-toothed monstrosity that was once human but was now driving forward for her heads in its dirty rags. It dropped down and rushed at us. Warnick pushed me behind her. My lantern dropped and cracked into the ground as I wobbled back in surprise. The mutant growled, and as it spun its arms in a powerful swing, knocking the gun and flashlight from Warnick's hands. Crap! She cried out as she got pushed back and dropped on my legs. Ah, oh, God damn it! I bellowed. The mutant stepped in the slow reveal of my lantern light. We needed to get out of here now. But what could we do when we didn't even have any weapons to fight with? One idea came to mind, but it was a hot one. I grabbed the saw and rolled my elbow into the pipe. That sent a full blast of steam into the saw and deflected it into the mutant's face. It screamed out aloud as its face melted off. That gave Warnick enough time to find her gun and fire it in the mutant's face. The mutant fell on the ground as he cried out in a fit of pain and slumped into a dead heap. Warnick and I were stone statues, watching in shock as the mutant winced and choked out its last breath. Our clothes moistened to the blood splatter of the now dead mutant. My morning started delightfully, but it ended pretty badly though. What we didn't expect was why the pressure break happened. It was them, those mutants. The ones that took Earth and left us hiding within this compound like a bunch of rats under a sewer. I didn't feel it then, but as the adrenaline left my body, boy, did I feel it after that ugly event. The scorching pain of hot water left my arm throbbing. Everybody woke up after that. By the time I reached the infirmary crying out in pain, the leader, Michael May, came down to check on me. Renfro, what the hell happened? He asked. His eyes lasered into my bruised arm as he tilted his head. I explained what happened and even asked where Warnick was. He wasn't sure about Warnick, but considering the direness of the situation, she was probably dealing with the chaos on the compound. My ears picked up on the chorus of noise, yells, and screeching sounds of shoes against the floors from the mass movement of people. Michael exhaled short breaths in front of me and asked, Huh? This has never happened before. How the hell did they get this far? Did you see any entranceways? Anything at all? I groaned and tapped my bandaged arm. No, sir. Just a broken pipe. That's it? He asked incredulously. I shuddered from the bluntness of the question, but I was still shell-shocked from being attacked, so it took a while for my brain to catch up the rolling conspiracies that probably formed in the mind of everybody here, including Michael. A mutant entered our compound. That had never happened in years, and that was never supposed to happen. I saw it in Michael's eyes, the same terror that was traveling through the compound and raising the voices of everyone within to frightening levels. We all knew that if a mutant entered the compound, we were going to die like the rest of the human race that got crushed under the monstrous hunger and rage. Even the nurse rushed out of the room and was heard down the hall inquiring from the other nurses any news on what was happening. What could I say to him? That was all I saw. I shook my head. I, I don't know, sir. I just... Renfro, don't break on me right now. Get off your fat ass. That pipe needs to be fixed. That's the first thing. We don't want to lose power to the machines when everything else is going to hell. A part of me wanted to complain about my burnt arm, but obviously... Michael could see that it wasn't life-threatening, 
and it wasn't a situation where I could avoid the urgency of the matter. I clenched my jaw and shook my head. Yeah, I'm coming, sir. Everything was a blur after that. When I came out of the infirmary, everybody was running around. There was a lot of shouting. I was able to return to the site of the attack, and the body of the mutant was gone with a cloud of water vapor filling the space. Empty. But the bloody hole was left to me as I crouched before the pipe system and proceeded to lock down this part of the pipe network. This was my home, and the only place I had. Because outside of it, the entire earth as far as we knew, was overtaken by mutants. They were once human beings like us, but a disease ravaged the earth. It spread like wildfire, turning our loved ones into unrecognizable creatures that only wanted our demise. We were the only ones immune to the disease. The spread of the disease was so quick, it was only classified as a global epidemic after the mutants became a problem. Two loud blasts froze me. I looked around and confirmed I was alone. A series of gunfire rang out, and it sent a destabilizing chill through me. What was going on? My breath became short as my eyes flicked around, anxious of what my cracked lantern could not reveal. Was that the mutants overrunning us as I stand here? Back then, mutants pulled the resources of police and armies while the disease took a hold of the world. People died in an immense wave of devastation as countries fell apart from the health services trying to support the rising deaths of people on both fronts to the undermanned government losing its wit in the madness. The mutants became such a threat that they were bombed, but it barely sufficed. They would not be defeated. It was like they were cockroaches. I worked my way to the auditorium floor. If there was any news, it was going to be there where Mr. May would announce anything to the residents. It was utter chaos. So many people were running around. Children were crying as their mothers tried to calm them. Fathers were lifting boxes and luggage with the urgency of ER doctors. I saw Michael talking to Miss Warnick and some other guards under a large floodlight hanging off the bar house. Miss Warnick turned to me as I walked up to them and pulled my bag tighter to my back. I said, Mr. May, I finished up, but I'm wondering if, if there is a tomorrow. Michael May finished. He glanced at the guards who got anxious at being put under the spotlight of his gaze. It was too late for that. My heart skipped a beat as my eyes widened and I noticed the blood smears on the shirts of the guards. Michael then said, The mutants broke through the section B wall. We were able to shut down that section, but as you know, that's next to section C. They take that over, we have no food provisions. Section C was where we had our farming efforts. Without that, all these people would starve to death. Michael continued, we need to leave. My heart dropped down a cliff and left me a mumbling fool in shock. I blinked and raised my hands in a desperate waver. Oh, hold on, hold on. You do realize the outside is worse. In here, we're protected. Outside, they number in the millions. We can't survive out there. Michael sighed. <sighs> Idiots. We can't survive in here. They already took over much of the compound. It's not like it's a few of them. It's hundreds breaking in front through the outside. It's the same freaking mutants who have been swarming our walls. For the past decade, they've been waiting for this opportunity. And now they've gotten it. I couldn't utter a word as I stood there in avid shock. The news alone brought up stark memories of me running from them as a teen. The creeping horror of their shadows chasing me in the thick of the night. I remembered very little from my last day of normalcy on Earth. Now, all I had was my blood-soaked clothes, a haggled breath shaking my body to the core, and a mind shackled to a body that was useless to me. This was my home for so long. I was so glad I found it, even though Mr. May and the rest of us weren't even sure what was out there. None of our radios picked up anything. We didn't know if any human beings existed beyond us. So, Renfro. I'm going to need your help with what we're about to plan. We're going to leave. 
but it's going to take us a while to pack everything and get everybody organized into the vehicles. What I need you to do is to help the guards at the wall, because that wall got damaged during their first assault. You know this place better than us, and I know they ain't going to stop. You have to keep those things from getting any further than Section C as long as you can. I shook my head and asked, I'm not sure about this leaving thing. What if we go outside and there's nothing out there? What are we going to do? Build another compound? The guards glanced at me for expressing my concern. I hated being the center of attention. It always made me squirm and look down at my oversized legs. Michael May's eyes flicked around, envious of the fear within the people he shepherded. I fidgeted when he glared through me. We'll figure it out when we get there, but we can't stay here. We don't have any time for blame. We can only move and have made my decision. And if push comes to shove and we have to build a new home, you need to be with us. So, do what you gotta do and do it quickly. Do I make myself clear, Renfro? I nodded reluctantly and replied, Yes, sir. Mr. May turned to Warnick and said, Escort him and make sure he makes it back. We'll be moving the vehicles to Section E. The rest of you, you know your duties. Now get to work. Michael May stomped away and so did some of the guards. I groaned inwardly to be left with such an important task. Worse to know that my failure was the death of everybody. My shoulder got slapped by a guard. I think his name was Brian. Brian said, Damn Renfro, you good? What are you shaking for? I hesitated, and that led to a round of laughter from the other guards. Warnick rolled her eyes and shook her head. Do you think this is the time to be making jokes? Brian scoffed and replied, Chill, everybody's on edge. Maybe you should lighten up. It was your guard duty that this screw up happened on. You don't see us saying nothing. I held my palms to try and calm them down, but my tongue got tied. Warnick smiled. Section B is your friend's section to guard. That's on his sleepy head. Brian replied, Whatever. Big boy better do his job, since you slow as hell for a fat boy. They gonna get you first. <laughs> he laughed and smacked my stomach as he walked around me. After Brian and the other guards left, Miss Warnick said, Ignore them. They're just jerks. I already knew that, but Brian's words sent chills down my spine. Brian was right. If I went outside, I was a huge target and not a fast one because of my weight problems. I really didn't like this, but we had to leave. Section C was the last bastion. I wasn't sure how much food they were going to take, and though our food stores were relatively plentiful, I could calculate it wasn't going to be more than several months of use, or more than a year, if Mr. May was strict enough. Some of the grain hadn't matured, but some could be saved. I had to see the situation first. So we went down to Section A and the halls were as empty as a fool's mind. But the clamorous sounds of a chaotic crowd emanated from the distance. Explosions boomed as well, so our people were still fighting. By the time we climbed onto the adjacent building next to the wall that separated Section C from the outside square to Section A, there were many dead bodies of mutants rested alongside human ones. I grimaced and tried keeping my head up to avoid looking at the bodies. Miss Warnick ducked and took up a large white gun with a narrow cannon-like barrel of a falling guard. She pulled back a lever and a low screech emanated as it powered on. The BM gun. It fired pellets that burst into an expanding glue. They would see the results of it, for a bubbly goo formed up and grew into the shattered bricks of the wall some 50 yards away. It was used to block the entrance of the mutants, but how long would that last? The closer we got, the louder the mutants and the raging desires to crash through the walls. A nauseating odor made me crinkle my nose and shook me off my rocker. My eyes caught sight of the leaking ethanol liquid from a bullet-ridden large tank next to an empty storage room. With Section A enclosed, the smell traveled from a good distance. Section C was enclosed, but had a retractable roof powered by steam actuators. Michael May didn't like to have the roof open at night, so once the crops got their sun, 
it was closed down. We made our way into the wall's top layer which allowed us to walk its narrow path. I looked down and I saw all of them. It must have numbered in the hundreds. I wasn't even sure, but this was what I could only see. I knew that beyond the horizon was more of them. That wasn't the thing that scared me though. I never saw so many eyes unwavering in their glares at me, as if I had stolen their life savings and left them destitute. In a way, they were, because they were hungry for our meat. The wall was covering scratch marks from their attempted climbs over it. It was only a matter of time before it broke with all those cracks I saw. Miss Warnick said, oh, Son of a... It's a whole horde of them! There was no way I could save Section C. That was a loss. So the huge vegetation that settled around these crazed mutants like a sore thumb and gave us our ground provisions was taken. On the edge of the belligerent crowd were ravenous mutants fiddling with the gates to the pigs' houses. There was another set of mutants bashing into a large metal gate to our section in crazed runs that shook it, sending an unsettling rattle into the air. Above that gate were men firing into the fray, hoping to war them off. But as one mutant was killed, another one from the crowd would just join the bashing line. Though they could not climb these walls due to their smoothness and height, our inner walls were not as thick and sturdy as the outside defenses. So with each rattle of the gate and wall, I feared my heart thump its last beat. Miss Warnick stared at me, hoping I had an idea. But what could we do, really? Blocking the door was probably not going to last, and there were too many of them to take out. There were not enough bullets for that, or maybe we didn't need any bullets. My eyes caught sight of the pipes traveling across the top of the wall. The steam was under a lot of pressure when it passed through, so it's hotter than a furnace. That last mutant and I felt the burn the last time. I said, I have an idea, but it's risky, because I won't be able to control it. Miss Warnick shrugged her shoulders at me. What is it? Steam. We can increase the pressure and create a screen over the wall from the spraying vapor. It can only last a while though, and we can abandon the wall. Okay, I see your point. Miss Warnick replied. It will weaken the foundation. Besides, this wall can hold anyway. We don't have the manpower when you burn the crops to the ground. I replied back. Burn the place down? That's when Warnick gave me that crazy look I was fearing. I scratched my forehead and said, No, just this area. I was thinking it didn't make any sense if we tried to defend the wall. I say, we turn this into a trap. Even if we lose the wall, they're going to struggle to get through because of the wildfire. Especially if you lock down the corridor to Section A. When we go back, they're going to get killed by carbon monoxide. They used to be us, so I'm willing to place a bet it affects them just like it affected us. Miss Warnick's facial expression softened as the idea began to crystallize in her mind. I added, Or it might blow up. Either way, it helps, I suppose. <sighs> okay, your call. Let's do it. Miss Warnick said. I pointed at the men behind her and said, Tell them to get off the wall and you can sort them out. Burn the forest. Fire holes in the pipe and let the steam press out. I'll deal with the technical stuff. Got it. Miss Warnick replied before running off. Luke, get me the napalm. I ran to the closest control box and set the controls to increase the pressure as my lungs collapsed from all that moving around. At this rate, my lungs would lose out long before these mutants. By the time I came back around, I was sweating up a storm. Low whistling screeches drew my attention to the burst of missiles flying into the crowd of mutants behind the wall. Blasts of red glowed behind the wall as the cries became deafening. The guards were doing a good job setting the crops ablaze. I jogged my tired self with the wall and my eardrums were crushed by the all-consuming sound of their pain. At the top of the landing, I saw a rising cloud of steam pushing into the hordes of mutants into the growing flames, crawling toward their backs in a caustic desire to feed on their flesh. Renfro! I huffed out a choke reply to Miss Warnick's shout. She stepped through an aura of steam with authority and grabbed my shoulder. Let's 
Go, Renfro. The guards ran into the square while I hobbled into it, terrified of the frequent bashing of the gate and louder cries. <sighs> it's done? She asked. I nodded my head and gestured at the wall. They're louder. <laughs> They're not enjoying their bath. I snickered and quickly suffocated that. Damn, I was tired, but I hit it and said, yeah, that should make them leave the walls for a bit. As soon as I said that, the wall caved in as the roars of the mutants raced over our beating hearts and consumed the air without mercy. Oh shit, they're coming! You guys retreat to the square. I'll need to block this up again. Miss Warnick said as she lifted the BM gun. There was no way she was going to be able to block a hole that big. No, you'll get overrun. The wall can fall. We'll plug up the connecting corridor. She looked at me with raised eyebrows, but after a brief second of indecision, she nodded her head resolutely and followed us. But after several seconds, they were running ahead of me while I was struggling behind them in choked huffs. Come on, Renfro! Miss Warnick shouted. My feet felt so heavy as I tried to keep up with Miss Warnick and others. The corridor leading out of this square was in sight. We only got 20 feet before the deafening shatter of the walls spewed forth and peeled down sections of it into the square. The mutants rushed into the square, crying for our deaths. Damn it! My mind went wild as I tumbled forward. I bounced against the cold concrete and rolled into a fire of bruised elbows and palms. Their cries got louder as they crept ever closer to the center. I couldn't move as fear ripped through what courage remained in my heart and left my limbs rigid as stone. It's over. There was no way I was going to survive this. Renfro! Warnick called. I glanced up and my faded sight peaked Miss Warnick as she rushed to my aid. No, she couldn't be serious. Was she crazy? They would kill her. I looked back at the shadows blurring into violent shapes that obviously desired to break me into pieces. One mutant growled as it reached out its claws. A blast of goo hits it in the face and sent it flying back. Explosions burst into the disorganized voices of mutants and unsettled my body into a white vein that ran cold. Mutants dropped left and right as the guards fired into their vanguard. <coughs> I coughed when I rolled onto my knees. Carl Renfro, don't you dare give up on me now! I shuddered in shame as she slid to a stop next to me, cocking back the BM gun ready for the next unload. She grabbed my collar and tried pulling me up. I was already resigned to giving up, but if she felt my life was worth it, I couldn't make myself look like some discarded leaf. Everything hurt, including my arm, but I was able to jam my elbows into the ground and lifted myself up. Pushing into her stomach, she doubled back as she fired the gun with one hand and curled me up with the other. My foot carried me forward, but it was like my legs were weighed down by the dead spirits that begged for me to join them. I reached into the grasp of one guard as we reached into the dark confines of the corridor. Back up! Miss Warnick shouted as she backed into us. She unloaded a new barrage of goo into an incoming wave of mutants. It formed and grew, tripping and grabbing the ankles of mutants around it. I called out breathlessly. Still the entrance! She spun around and blasted into the narrow entrance two times. And that was enough for the goo expanded into the entrance. We were sealed in and darkness overcame us. Only our breaths were heard in this enclosed space. Their cries were nothing more than distant buzzes as the walls and housing outside of the goo fell apart from their incessant rampage. <sighs> that turned out well, Miss Warnick said. My hand grasped my face and moisture transferred off it in a slimy discharge worthy of disdain. I said, Sorry. Light burst forth from a flashlight. It flashed in my face. My hands raced to shield the light until it went down. Hey, we're alive. That's all that matters. 
Miss Warnick said. Sometimes, I forget that was all we needed. After Warnick shot Gu into the corridor to enforce the blockage, we navigated our way through the darkness back to the evacuation efforts. The blockage surprisingly held its ground, and before we knew it, we were living the only hope we knew. It was still all strange to me. My fear was slightly gone now. All that was left was a sense of longing. When many of us looked back at the compound, all we saw was a building fire that overcame half of it, losing an immense column of black smoke. Many of the residents coughed and cursed my name on their lips. I didn't care much anymore. Death was our best friend now. Who knew where we would end up or if tomorrow we would get killed by a mob of them? They're not going to survive that. Miss Warnick said as she stared into the flames. I huffed out breathlessly. <sighs> Sad to see it go, but we've bitten them this time, even in retreat. I could take that to the grave, I think. The smoke obscured the roads leading out of it, so we were safe from those mutants. It was a question of the other mutants we would meet, but that was for tomorrow. Today, we mourned our home and walked the trek to look for another. Hey Creepypasta fans, it's Keon. Thank you for listening tonight. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you'd like to officially support the Dark Cosmos, you can do so by clicking on the join button. Membership starts at only $5. Until next time everyone, and remember, stay cosmic. Look at the many before you who have perished away. Give up. A death in your bunker is less painful than the one that awaits you above the surface. You will join the mess of human flesh and bones with which they build their own bodies. If you stand against them, you will meet a fate similar to those who resisted before you. Astrid opened her eyes. The smell of medicine and freeze-dry food wafted through the air as she lay in her bunk bed, mind flitting from one voice to another, her body preparing itself for what would be doomsday. Twenty-five years of her life had been spent listening to the voices inside her head. Right from the day she'd been born, into this biohazardous planet today. Yet, this week, they'd gotten awfully loud and comprehensible, unlike before, when they were just a jamble of jittery whispers that made no sense, except to warn Astrid every time of impending danger, saving her life countlessly. While she was one of the finest soldiers on the Twelfth Legion, the impending extraterrestrial doom that was to come tomorrow would take away that prestige from her too. The voices in her head had left no stone unturned to stop her from fighting what was to come in the morning. Deep in a corner of her mind, a bittersweet thought often formed. What would her life have been like? if she had lived and died before day zero. A fateful day, when life on Earth as humans knew it, changed forever. You know they're dead, right? Mag said from her bunker bed above, sensing that Astrid had been roused awake after just twenty minutes of sleep. My ma used to say some voodoo magic is within you, lets you know stuff we don't. Only the dead know these things. Come on, tell me, what are they saying? They're telling me that Mags is full of shit, Astrid said sleepily, getting a chuckle from her friend in return. Chocolate? Asked Mags, her thick olive-toned arm shooting out from the side of her bed, swinging a bar of ration chocolate in Astrid's direction. No, Mags, Astrid replied. Shouldn't you be eating something a bit healthier? You're 30 weeks pregnant, and this isn't the time for callousness. 
Who cares? Max said, nonchalantly. It's all going to be over in a few days. Might as well let my little bubble of joy experience the wonders of chocolate before that. Astrid stared up at the underside of Mag's bed. Her fellow comrade had been taken over by fever right before the world was preparing to collapse on itself, before their eyes. That too, for a child, that would most probably never grow up. For the last two years, the Twelfth Legion had been preparing for Doomsday, the day the extraterrestrial pods woke up to their newly morphed atmosphere and took over whatever was left of Earth once and for all. They'd made their first appearance 50 years ago, in the year 2187, absorbing most of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and replacing it with methane. Today, the Earth stood hostile for all of a life, its surfaces dead and barren, while Astrid sat with the remnants of the human race 600 feet below the surface. She wondered what was going on above, Comrades! shouted Dr. Jamil through the announcement speakers, startling Astrid and breaking her from her train of thought. To the mess hall and bar. Around a thousand soldiers had gathered in the mess hall within a few minutes of Dr. Jamil's assembly call, all very anxious and jittery on what would be their last day below the surface. The mess hall was where they ate, discussed, collaborated, and planned. To describe it as a colossal would be an understatement. It was the largest hall in Tasselboro, the underground city they had built over the last five decades, enough to seat a couple thousand soldiers at any given time. In the last few years, Dr. Jamil had used this mess hall as a work haven, creating extensive battle strategies for Doomsday. Intricate, down to the finest details, complete with numerous backup plans that covered every possibility of mishap once the soldiers were released into the hostile environment above. As you know, comrades, Dr. Jamil said, Tomorrow is the first day, the very beginning of your lives. Tomorrow we create a new day zero. Let us go over our plans briefly to avoid any last minute confusions. Astrid looked at the doctor's eyes that were filled with deep sorrow probably a remnant of grief that he had experienced after his wife and two kids were killed a couple of days after Day Zero. Yet, in his eyes glimmered a ray of hope that had stayed unextinguished all this time. Now that the countdown to these pods releasing the radiodromes was finally coming to an end, he felt a bittersweet satisfaction at these last moments. Helmet! He called out. Describe to me what the pods are and how you would destroy them upon opening. Helmet stood up. The short, scrawny boy's biggest advantage was that he didn't seem like a threat. Yet Astrid had seen him and fought with him multiple times. He was light, fast, and very nimble, and had subsequently caused a lot of damage to many of the radiodromes before they went into hibernation. Sir! Each pod is a breeding capsule for the radiotromes. They've been known to drag fresh human bodies fallen in battle to the pods. Word says it's to source their nutrition while they're in the pods and create more radiodromes from the tissue material, but we aren't sure yet. The outer layer of the pods are made of a pure organic carbon skeleton material that is impenetrable. Thus, the only surefire way to destroy one is to drop a grenade into it when it's open. Dr. Jamil looked satisfied, motioning to Helmet to sit down with his hand. Very well. Now, Jean will tell us what Operation Purgatory will look like. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Juan stood up, straightening his shoulders. As the leader of the 14th Legion, I will lead my soldiers to the roundabout at the Joan of Arc where lies a great sack of pods lined up high against the monument. We will reach there at 9 a.m., three hours before the pods split open and douse the pods in a mixture of highly flammable gasoline and diesel. As soon as the pods split open, we light them ablaze. Any remaining survivors from within the pods will be shot down by our war machine, Berserk. Good job, John Carlos. The leader of the 14th Legion, sat back in his chair, but he didn't seem too happy with the compliment he'd just received from his mentor. Instead, 
A white paper hue decorated his lips, a sign Astrid recognized as anxiety. She could understand. They'd all live their lives down here in the city of Bunkers. And while they obviously wanted to reclaim the Earth for human rehabilitation, a lot of them knew they wouldn't survive long enough to see it happen. Dr. Jamil pointed towards the 12th Legion next, at Rave specifically. Rave Lightfoot? What can you tell us about the Operation Starlight? Rave responded in a series of grunts in sign language. Uh, uh, uh. To be awarded by a wave of delighted applause. While he was just a disabled teen with an intense passion about his homeland, Astrid absolutely despised him for some reason. As a baby, he was found in the decaying forest not far from the bunkers, burned up and injured brutally, right at the brink of death. He couldn't speak, couldn't walk without leg braces, and the melted skin on his face had covered most of his left eye and ear, which the very trained medical team at Tasselborough had surgically fixed and replaced with implants. Even though he was in no shape to fight, he always insisted his fate was written this way, and although Astrid hated to admit it, he was particularly good at devising foolproof plans. Astrid didn't hate him because he was disabled. That was, in retrospect, one of the few things that she respected about him. The fact was that whenever he was nearby, the voices in Astrid's head exploded like a hydrogen bomb ranging from whispers of danger when he was a couple hundred meters away, to full-blown screams of agony when he was grunting directly to her. Astrid could never understand what was wrong with him or herself, but she had to just learn to avoid him, which was quite difficult to do since they were in the same legion. Young soldiers of Earth, tomorrow is a new day zero. Tomorrow, you fight for all of us. You will fight for those who are afraid for their future, for their children, for their lives. You will cleanse the earth from these atrocities once and for all. Prayers. The thing Jamil didn't tell them about Doomsday is how they'd wake up feeling different, knowing that death was almost certainly barreling towards them like a hungry hound. Astrid woke up the same exact way, welcomed by the screaming voices in her head as well. She knew this would happen, and had taken melatonin pills beforehand to fall asleep faster. Nonetheless, her slumber had been plagued by vivid nightmares that spoke to her of death and decay, and their whispers remained when her eyes opened. Comrades! Dr. Jamil shouted through the intercom. Avenge our race! Free planet Earth from this plague! Fear no being that comes in your way! Astrid fidgeted around her mask and armor, feeling the air whooshing around them through the vibrations of the aluminum plane as it carried the 12th Legion to Ground Zero. The Kevlar suit she wore was lightweight, bulletproof, and a good barrier against the toxic methane outside, which wouldn't kill a human instantly, but would leave some nasty side effects once they were done. Ground Zero was a battered wasteland right out of a fictional horror. The sight they saw was absolutely terrifying as the plane descended through the scorching air. The Valley of Namsa, a rocky, stony desert land, was filled with thousands of pods, all shielded with sand and mud three quarters of their lengths through. Above each cluster of pods hovered what Astrid immediately recognized as the Betatrons, intricate androids evident of advanced extraterrestrial engineering that the scientists at Tasselborough had yet to identify and replicate. Each Betatron periodically emitted a blasting sound at a known radio frequency, which was their way of communicating with and analyzing the developing radiodromes within the pods. From afar, they looked like giant electronic octopi, using their giant suction tubes to get a grip of the ground as they skimmed over the pods, ripening the radiodromes inside. Inside the body of each Betatron lay their motherboard, a small rectangular circuit, which, upon destruction, deactivated the entire machine. However, if it was one thing Astrid truly feared, it was an Alphatron. These androids were like octopi, except that they were highly intelligent and crawled through the wasteland at terrifying speeds, killing everything in their path. They had the habit of doing a death roar before killing their opponents, a deathly noise, 
powerful enough to warp the time and space around their kill, making them one of the biggest reasons they were able to conquer Earth on Day Zero. Odin, the Slayer, and Bjorn, the Crusher, knelt down next to either side of Astrid as the Twelfth Legion observed the Valley of Namsa, cautiously preparing for Operation Stealth. The Nordic genes of the twins and their fondness for violence had brought them quite some popularity amongst the Legion, and though Astrid wouldn't admit it, she was quite fond of them too. Through their gas masks, they breathlessly motioned everyone to get closer. There are 43 Betatrons and 17 Alphatrons roaming down there. There are 120 of us here. Subleash and Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. Take the UV Blaster and attack five of the Alphatrons that are shimming by the river. Remember to paralyze them with the UV before attacking. Don't get into the Death Roar Zone and make sure you collect their motherboards. Sublegion Echo to November. Start destroying the Betatrons, but do so stealthily and silently. We don't want any chaos down there. Sublegion Oscar to Zulu. Spread the medical camp behind the rocks. Something tells me there will be quite some casualties. Astrid strapped her machetes and her grenades on her belt, securing her single cyanide capsule in a little pocket. She'd eaten two antipsychotics today to keep the voices in control since there was no way she could afford another schizophrenic episode right in the middle of the battle. And thankfully, all she had to endure now were the slight whispers of fear whenever she got too close to a Tron or Rave. The only voices she wanted to hear today would be from the earpiece she wore, since communicating with allies whilst wearing the gas mask was quite tedious. Against her chest, she held her gun, a silent yet deadly weapon, quick and damaging enough to kill a radiodrome within seconds. She felt a hand on her shoulder, and turned around to face her best friend, and former Sublegion Alpha member, Max, who had been shifted to Sublegion Oscar, posed her 22-week gestation mark. Good luck, Astrid. Max smiled sadly. Be a bad girl down there. Give me a good show. I'm watching. Astrid looked at the person closest she would come to calling a sister and gave her a tight hug. Dr. Jamil had pleaded with Max to stay within Tasselborough, but she had insisted upon fighting with Sublegion Alpha. After many days of debating, they had reached this arrangement of compromise. Astrid jogged with the four other members of Sublegion Alpha towards the empty radiodrome burrows, which they used to crawl down to the base of the valley without being seen. Sublegion Alpha, acknowledge this message and confirm your presence, Dr. Jamil said through the earpiece all the way from the control room in Tasselborough, where everything was being monitored tightly. Present. Odin and Bjorn replied. Here. Astrid replied. Present. Helmut said. Ah. Rave grunted. Good. Dr. Jamil said. Proceed cautiously. My radar has detected three Alphatrons in your vicinity, the nearest one being a couple hundred meters away. Let's go. Odin said through the earpiece. The Alphatron was a lot more terrifying now that they were right in its danger zone. It was indeed a large creature. Astrid noticed, its tentacles each being at least 20 meters long. It was crawling slowly up a cliffside, which the Nordic brothers silently dragged the UV blaster out into the open, its panel facing the otherworldly entity. The brothers signaled to Astrid and Helmut that the machine was ready to be fired. Hey, asshole! Helmut shouted. The Alphatron shifted its head towards their group, faster than they could process. It scurried down the side of the cliff at a terrifying speed, barreling towards them with the help of its razor-lined tentacles, its mouth half open in preparation of the death roar. It slowed down within a hundred meters of the group, producing eerie chirping sounds, which Astrid recognized as the Alphatron using echolocation to analyze the subjects before itself. You will never conquer the ones without humanity. Look at his face. It is covered in the blood of your kin. Run. Do not trust the betrayer amongst you. He can look through you, and you will not be able to avenge us. Shut up, Astrid whispered firmly, tapping her left temple. Not now. I need to focus. Bjorn quickly flipped the UV blaster on, suspending the creature mid-roar. Its mouth was open, but no sound came out. 
it had been held in a deadly trance. As if right on cue, Helmut jumped down from the ledge he'd been standing and swiftly climbed the Tron's back, right up to the latch where the motherboard lay. He unsheathed his dagger from his belt and broke open the latch, pulling out a greasy black circuit board that smelled like decaying bodies and foul oil. Immediately, the buzzing that came from deep within the Alpha Tron's body ceased, and the Tron dropped dead on the floor. One Alpha Tron down, northeast to the base camp, Astrid said excitedly into the earpiece. They'd taken down this one within minutes, and it would be just a few more hours before they'd have cleansed the entire valley of these foul entities. But fate had been cruel, and would prove to be cruel today, too. Within the space of 15 minutes, multiple things happened, changing the dynamic of battle completely. Initiated by a sharp whirring sound echoing through the air, as all the battalions heard a frantic message. Mayday! Mayday! This is Captain Arthur speaking from the Namaseer, carrying the 6th and 8th legions of the force to Pym. We've been hit by a laser beam from a rogue Betatron. Both our engines have been compromised. I'm making an emergency landing in the Valley of Namsa. May the Lord have mercy on us. As Sub-Legion Alpha looked into the sky atop the battlefield, they spotted the Namaseer leaving behind a trail of thick black smoke in the sky as it lowered its descent into the valley. Captain Arthur must have gotten a deadly yet supposedly brilliant last-minute idea, they realized, as the plane shot towards the biggest Betatron hanging above the valley, its tentacle-like suction devices moving slowly and unprepared across the ground. As the 6th and 8th Legion collided to their deaths, a brilliant mushroom of light illuminated the entire valley, blindingly, sending off fiery blobs all across the sky. The massive explosion produced a boom so loud that Astrid was deaf for a good few minutes before the tinnitus began to subside. Suddenly, a deafening groan shook the earth, vibrating everything very similar to how an earthquake would. See, Captain Arthur's brave landing in the Valley of Namsa no matter how good in taste the sacrifice was made, had brought upon them all severely deadly consequences. The explosion had been loud enough to disturb the radio frequencies which the Trons used to communicate with the pods, which were now receiving a very new and very dangerous signal. <coughs> Damn it, thought Astrid, frantically tapping her forehead. They will sniff out the stench of your fear that emanates from your flesh. You better warn the others, too. Blood will flow thick and heavy like a monsoon rain. Tonight is a slaughter, and this valley will entomb your bones forever. But your flesh, of course will be draped on the bodies of the Devil's Spawn. Aborting Operation Stealth! I repeat, aborting Operation Stealth! Subletion Alpha is approaching the base camp. I request all the subletions to step back and report all casualties to Dr. Jamel. Immediately! Odin shouted into his mouthpiece. The screaming in Astrid's ear got worse as she felt the ground rumble, as if something was rushing towards them. It was perplexing, and no plan of Dr. Jamil's had prepared them for this. Oh god, Astrid said. It's the Alphatrons. They're coming here. We need to leave. Where is Rave? Where is Rave? Bjorn screamed into his mouthpiece, looking frantically around him. He was standing next to the Alphatron a few moments ago! Helmut screamed back. We need to leave, man! I'm going! The Alphas are almost at our heels, and we have only one UV blaster! We cannot take them all down at once! Astrid! Mag's voice echoed through the airpace out of nowhere, startling the running soldiers. Astrid, you need to listen to me! Max lay against the cliff wall, a few feet above them on a jutting rock, and the sight of her made Astrid's stomach turn. As the rest of Sublegion Alpha fled the scene, she ran in the opposite direction, climbing the burrow holes to reach her friend as the sun went down. Soon enough, Astrid realized something awful had happened. Mag's clothes had been tattered to shreds, 
and a single shard of razor-sharp obsidian stuck out of her abdomen, decorated by a pool of blood. In her hands lay a bundle of cloth, which Astrid unwrapped and screamed. Max, she cried, what has happened? Come on, take my arm. Let's go up to the med base. Please, Max, open your eyes. Shut up and listen carefully, Max repeated woozily, at the brink of sleep. It's Rave. I don't know why he did this or what he's up to, but there have been a bunch of silent assassinations at camp. I found him poisoning the groundwater we had purified, so I confronted him, and that son of a bitch stabbed me. Totally didn't see that coming. I had to warn you. I can't go back up there. I don't have the strength to. Hot tears ran down Astrid's face, as steam collected in her gas mask. Hands shivering, Max handed Astrid over the bundle of cloth, in which lay a tiny, lifeless body. I named him Hector Jr., after his daddy. My boy will finally have both his parents with him. Max said, brown eyes focusing on a distance and becoming glassier by the second. As Astrid wept beside her with Hector Jr. cradled in her arms. And just like that, Max was gone forever. Fate was cruel enough not to give Astrid the time to mourn her friend. And shortly after Max departed, the vibrations had gotten louder and were coming towards them from below, as Astrid realized the Alphatrons had begun their ascent on the cliff. That too, in the dark. She couldn't leave Mag's body and her baby like this in the open, where the radiodromes would use their tissue to replicate an organic body. So she spent the next few minutes tediously dragging Mag's body into the entrance of an abandoned nearby burrow. Through the tears, she removed her friend's mask to see her gentle face one last time. Propping Hector Jr. in her arms, Astrid kissed her friend goodbye as the wave of the unbeknownst Alphatrons outside rumbled past them. The group sat silently on the clifftop, cheering quietly for the victory of the 14th Legion at the Joan of Arc. The survivors of the first half sat under the shade of a huge, dead tree atop the cliff, some greasy and bloody. Others in considerably better shape. Rave Lightfoot had the audacity to sit with the other survivors on top of rock, sitting in the middle of the base camp, seemingly consoling one of the injured soldiers by patting them on their back as they drank water from a metal canister. Rave! Astrid thundered towards the group, her mind thirsty for blood and her hands itching for a kill. He heard her enraged voice call out his name. Yet he could not have imagined why she'd do that. He had watched a stabbed mags tumble down the side of the cliff with his own eyes, an event to which there was no witnesses save himself. Thus he could not have imagined that his entire plan had been ruined by one formerly pregnant female. Astrid pulled off Rave's gas mask and tossed it aside, swiping her dagger across Rave's face and slicing open a huge, gaping slit right across his mutilated features. He put his hands on his wound in shock as blood poured down his chin and dripped into the dead ground. <gasps> a collective gasp rose from the group as people processed what Astrid had done. Tell them how you killed Max, you traitor! Astrid screamed, hot tears of rage welling in her eyes. Tell them how you stabbed her ruthlessly! Rafe stared at her in disbelief, shock at the notion that his treacherous truth had been unveiled. He initiated a series of grunts and motioned to Odin in sign language, uh, uh. but was stopped as the latter's hand grasped his throat. What's she saying, Rave? Odin asked quietly. He's also poisoned some of the groundwater, and I bet it was you who sabotaged the Nomisir too, to make it an easier target for the Betatron. As expected, Rave had no explanation for that. He shrugged off Odin's hand and slowly backed away from the group, motioning in sign language rapidly. I've never been one of you, and neither did you all fully accept me as your own. He motioned. Tron fluid has flowed through my blood since the very beginning, enabling me to communicate with my kin using the very same radio frequency they use. Sorry, but we know all your plans. We've known you were coming here since the very beginning. And that is why I insisted upon being in this legion, despite my disabilities. This landscape does not belong to you anymore. 
We will conquer it just like you humans conquered it from the rest of the animal kingdom in the past. I am insignificant, and I am done here. With that last sign, Rafe unveiled a cyanide pill from his belt, preparing to pop it in his mouth, only to be cut short when a high kick from one of the Tenth Legion's girls knocked it out of his hands. Bind him up. Bjorn screamed, as Rafe broke into a weak sprint, with which half a dozen soldiers caught up to, easily. Helmut and a few others quickly wrapped him up in a makeshift straitjacket within minutes and pushed him toward the ground. We go back to war within a few hours. The pods have ripened up completely and will be opening soon. We initiate Operation Starlight as soon as the pods first start opening. Remember to step away from the blaze as soon as you see it appear. Rave will be at the front of our mission. And his job is to let us know if any Trons are in the vicinity or not. If he's unin, we'll know they aren't there. If he's in. Well, that's pretty clear too. As the sun came up, Astrid looked at the Valley of Namsa, the pods that were shaking violently, ready to open and unleash the horror within. Before Day Zero, she imagined couples coming here for romantic picnics something she herself would never experience. Perhaps after today, many eons into the future, her descendants would come here one day to enjoy the land that rightfully belonged to them. The valley was now lit ablaze as the 12th Legion doused gasoline onto pods and released flares onto them. The entire valley seemed to be collapsing, its floor sinking deeper and deeper until it looked like the mouth of a fiery volcano, ready to blast the onlookers with its fire any time. Astrid looked down through her gas mask onto the craters of hell. She knew death was certain. But they weren't going to die on their knees, raising a battle cry into the air that was now hostile to them. Machetes clutched in each hand. Astrid and the last few humans jumped into the crater as the pods shook open determined to give the walking radiodromes the last good morning of their lives. As they reached the base, Astrid saw the newly designed radiodromes coming out of their slimy pods, and the hair on the back of her neck stood up. Their bodies were a tangled mass of flesh and blood, and it looked like the glimpse of a half-rotted human face stuck to the torso of a radiodrome for Astrid to release in horror. That this is why the Trons and previous generations of radiodromes had a habit of dragging the bodies of their fallen foes into their burrows, to partially digest and remold them. She started to gun down the screeching radiodromes, the fire upon them doing half of the damage too. This is for you, Mags! Astrid screamed as a radiodrome's inside splattered across the ground after encountering a bullet from her gun. Soon, her magazines had emptied completely. All around her, bodies fell. She saw Helmet looking for her from a mid-cliff ledge, only to realize that he was dead and staring into nothingness. The Nordic twins charged right into a group of shrieking radiodromes with a berserk machine creating a blast of energy as the radiodromes fell. Yet, in no time, more powered up upon the twins after sensing the disturbance. And soon, Astrid realized that there was no way the twins could have survived the pack of hungry entities crawling into their bodies like that. She climbed the ledge upon which Helmut rested to retrieve his fully loaded weapon, as a few remaining paramedics watched the scene below in horror. Head filled with rage, Astrid shot at the mass of entangled flesh below with complete focus and aim. Dr. Jamil! She cried into the mouthpiece, which she hoped was still working. We need reinforcements. This is Astrid from the 12th Legion. We are stranded in the Valley of Namsa. It is highly likely that we will not make it. The silence on the other end was too loud. But Astrid was delighted when a few moments later, she heard the rumble of aircrafts at a distance, speeding towards them. Yet, she knew they wouldn't make it in time. Slowly, as the rest of her legion perished below her, she realized the radiodromes had turned their attention to the clifftop, where the untrained paramedics scuttled around in panic, 
Astrid removed her gas mask and pulled the pins from all six of her grenades. She jumped from the ledge, eyes closed, free for the first time in her life. Unpinned grenades still strapped to her belt as she soared above the cliff and ultimately down into the screeching radiodromes that eagerly awaited her fall. All the voices in her head woke up together, quite calming and relaxing for the first time ever. We welcome you to Valhalla, Fallen Martyr. Hey sci-fi horror fans, it's Kira Rhodes. Thanks to all the VAs who helped with the production of this video. And thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Craving for another scary story? Click that video on your screen. Until next time everyone, and remember, stay cosmic. Chapter 1 The room was filled with the sound of tapping feet, battering lashes, awkward cuffs, and the reverberation of shivering torsos as we all did our best to avoid being caught in the crosshairs of an ill-timed gaze. Most of us simply stared off into the distance, redirecting our sight to the vapor-covered windows that made the walls of the building. The avoidance of gazes across the oval conference table went on for an unbelievable amount of time, just as much time as it took to disengage from accidentally locking eyes with someone else. It had just been 30 minutes, but somehow felt longer. To cope, some began twirling objects between their fingers, a pen, a penny, a pencil, anything to occupy them while they waited. This seemed to cure the issue of jumpiness, but it didn't last. One person's coping mechanism began to make another antsy. It was entropy at its finest. Locked in this edging stalemate of anxiety and awkwardness, it didn't take long before someone stood from the other side of the oval glass table and asked what everyone was thinking. Where the f- I mean, where's Edward? He should have gotten here by now. There was no answer to the question, not immediately at least as the question was on everyone's mind, something that couldn't be said for the answer. After a few minutes, some seconds really, Edward's assistant stood from her chair and apologized for Edward's lateness. She explained that he hadn't answered several of her calls, and the one he did answer sounded mumbled and odd, something she explained away as poor reception on his end. After she had given a reason for Edward's absence, or at least a reason for not knowing the reason behind his absence, she asked for more time as he was sure to arrive before the additional wait time elapsed. There wasn't much choice. Everyone waited for another 25 minutes. It would have been nice to say Edward had shown up before the time elapsed, but he didn't. She stood up after the 25th minute, and it was clear to see that she was about to ask for more time, but the words hadn't made it out from her lips before the collective stare of people locked in the conference room for almost an hour led her to do something else. The meeting for the upcoming project was postponed because of Edward's absence. He was the project director, and the body couldn't walk without its head for long, and as such, having the meeting without him would have amounted to talking to the wind. There was a loud grumbling of mutual annoyance heightened by a hiss or two from the room's extreme after the end of the meeting was called. The scorn was earned. My annoyance at the postponement didn't trump my anger at the time wasted waiting in the conference room. There was nothing I hated more than meetings that could have been emails. These were the sort of commodities Edward peddled in. He was a meeting guy. That is why, as annoying as it was, it was also weird that he hadn't been in attendance. Edward wasn't one to miss meetings or even workdays at all. He was always the first one in the building and the last one out. At least, I think he was the last one. I never stayed in the building long enough to find out. Maybe he was sick? I thought. But I could have sworn he never took sick days either. The thought didn't stay on my mind for long as I began packing my stuff to make it out of the conference room. 
There were slight whisperings between some in the room, no doubt, talking about the same thing I was thinking of with a grim expression on their face. I was about to stand when a loud hum pinned me to the chair. Are you alright, Ethan? Someone asked. You look as if you're about to pass a stone. My words felt heavy, so I gestured yes with my hands and remained on the chair. The hum intensified and trailed off as soon as it began. Everyone had trailed out of the conference room by the time I came to. With a slight push and pull, I slipped from behind the chair and made it outside the conference room. Walking back to my cubicle, just after stepping out of the door, I noticed the office's emptiness. Did everyone decide not to come to work today? Or was it a holiday? Had I lost track of time again? The parting of the slide doors that followed the ding saw me step out of the elevator and onto the fifth floor, where my office, cubicle, was located. A few seconds after getting to the cubicle, I brought out a pen and continued twirling it from where I stopped in the conference room. My annoyance at Edward's absence had turned into curiosity. There were a few things that were sure. Death, taxes, and Edward coming to work under any circumstance. I mean... The man came to work while his wife was in labor. Was he dead? Why are you thinking about this? I asked myself. He probably got wrapped in something more important. And what was that sound in the conference room? I stopped twirling and put the pen at work doodling and scribbling concepts for the next meeting, whenever it was. I was still sketching designs when I heard footsteps headed towards me. It was John. What did he want now, I thought. Hey, Ethan! Hey man, want to grab a drink after work? Would have loved to, but I already planned something with my girlfriend. Fancy restaurant and all that. <laughs> I said, Okay. He said before leaning into the edge of the cubicle, a sure sign he wasn't about to start leaving. Is it just me or has it been colder these past few weeks? I almost dismissed the notion but caught myself before I did. Perhaps some are just taking a bit of time to kick in even though it already did. Do you think it has anything to do with the disappearance people are talking about online? Uh, what missing people? I asked, prompting John to pull out his phone from his pocket. After a tap, he handed me the rectangular brick with a smug look on his face that I imagine a reporter who was the first to stumble on a piece of information would have. I flipped through the headlines talking about missing people. They all read like conspiracies. So I handed John back his phone and made a mental reminder to text my girlfriend when John left. Hey, are you alright? Your eyes almost gazed over, John said. Did you hear that? I asked as I held my head. Well, it was just a hum the first time. It almost sounded as if someone had been trashing about very loudly this time. Hear what? I waved a question. It was probably just a migraine, I reasoned. Wait, aren't you supposed to be at the meeting? John asked, interrupting my thoughts again. I intimated him with the account of the meeting before going back to the paper. It's unlike Edward not to come to work, John said before leaving. At least, I think he left. I hadn't actually seen him leave. Edward's absence meant we could go home early, so I did. I took my one-handed bag, filled it with my laptop and notepads, crossed it over my body and started for the elevator. That's when I saw it. Folded between the clouds for a second, I looked harder into the cloud, but there was nothing there. Ha! Ah, great. I was seeing things that weren't there now. I couldn't afford to drink the Kool-Aid or whatever John was handing out. Purging my mind of the thoughts wasn't easy, but I did, mostly just replacing them with something else as I entered the elevator. Why was it so cold? It was July, and I could have sworn I saw a snowflake back there. It had no business being this cold. I thought as my mind harkened back to the shivering torsos. I walked out of the elevator in the building. I was almost clear of it when someone grabbed me violently and began yanking at it. One swift turn brought me to face the culprit. Almost an inch from punching, I stopped to look at the disheveled man with torn clothes, unkempt hair, and a miasma rivaling smell. It was Edward. Chapter 2 Despite being in it, 
to ride over here had flown past me as the thoughts in my mind looped back to Edward's unexplainable transformation. No matter how much my mind prodded the situation for any discernible resolution, it came up blank. The lack of an answer created a loop that caused me to descend more levels for reasons that refused to present themselves, if they existed at all, that is. It had taken Leslie calling me a couple of times for me to step out when the cab arrived. Even now, I remember, her voice brought me back and pulled me out of spiraling further into the rabbit hole. Ethan? Ethan? Yes. Yes? Where were you just now? What? I asked, not sure what was happening. Leslie looked at me with an inclined head to measure my attention against an unseen metric. She suggested calling the entire thing off if I wasn't ready. I'm sorry. I was thinking of something, I said before sitting up. We were seated in the Sea Pearl, a restaurant in the outer part of the city, just by the water. Catching a break from going down the rabbit hole, I allow myself to take in the outdoor restaurant. It had set pieces as breathtaking as its surrounding. So enough of living in your head. I think it's time to order, don't you? Leslie asked. Yeah, yeah, of course. I said as I signaled our readiness to order from the sole waiter on the floor. She stopped a few inches from our table, wearing a big smile and a golden bracelet with a heart in the middle to match. What will you be ordering today? It took less than a minute to order. After ordering, we began to chat as we waited for the food to come. The waiter had promised us a 15-minute window before our dish arrived. Leslie and I had been trying to get into the Sea Pearl for years. 15 minutes was a small price to pay. Leslie decided that we could use the time to catch each other up on our day. I agreed and prompted her to go first as I wasn't quite certain about what really happened during mine. All right. She started, telling me about a strange earthquake she had read about online. Apparently, the tremor had come out from nowhere without the usual telltale signs. Huh, that's strange. I remarked as my mind began mulling over possible collations with the cold. It was, Leslie said before telling me about the rest of the day. Her co-workers were still a pain to work with and the job hadn't gotten less hectic. Nothing out of the ordinary, she summed up before passing the question to me. I took a huge breath before explaining how my day had started annoyingly and became stranger as the clock counted down. I broached the topic, bumping into Edward just outside the lobby. What do you think happened to him? Leslie asked. I thought about it for the upteenth time that day and still couldn't come up with a reason. The only answer I could attempt was that he must have fallen in with the wrong crowd or probably got wasted the previous day at a party or something. I didn't stay behind after I handed him over to the building security. Leslie also found the experience odd. But what was odder was that Edward kept repeating the phrase, They are coming. They are here. I asked several times what he meant, but he didn't seem to have the answer, or, if he did, wasn't inclined to share. Leslie's eyes were filled with a curiosity that mirrored mine. Did it have anything to do with what John said? Although I tried not to, I couldn't help but ask if she had heard cases of disappearances on the news. She replied that she had before moving on to ask if I believed it, as if every disappearance case felt like something out of a prankster's mind. Should we leave? She asked. The answer to her question was interrupted by the hum again. I was getting tired of the unnecessary outbreaks. After weathering the humming, I moved to answer her question. We couldn't leave. We'd been trying to get a reservation at this restaurant for a long time to let a few unverified claims cause us to lose the reservation. Leslie pointed out the relative emptiness of the restaurant and I countered that restaurants like this one often kept themselves exclusive by giving the illusion of desire even if it cost them sales. It's probably her lucky day, I suggested. Talking about fine dining, I wondered why our orders weren't here yet. It was already 25 minutes. Was everyone intentionally keeping me waiting? There was probably some god out there playing a prank on me. Hi, excuse me. I called the waiter and queried the status of our order. She was shocked to see we hadn't gotten what we had ordered. 
I'm going to check on the chef. She replied and stepped out of sight. There was a slight scream after she went in. What was that? I asked no one in particular as I turned around to check if anyone was bothered about the scream that rang out from inside. When no one did anything about the scream, I stood from the chair and started for the kitchen when Leslie held me by the hand. Where are you going? She asked. I told her I meant to check the kitchen and she answered by demanding that we leave. Something felt off about all of this. I mean, come on, we haven't paid. We can just leave now, get a cheap bottle of wine, and drink ourselves to sleep. After I think about it, I refused. I promised you a good time, and that is what I'm going to provide. A good time? Don't you want that, babe? We should have gone home, but flattered by the admiration I saw behind Leslie's words and the urge to find out what the hum was, I matched on even as the unbothered patrons remained unbothered. Something horrible hit my nose as I got closer to the kitchen, but I paid no heed. With the sole goal of eating in the restaurant, I continued, only stopping to look through the embedded circular glass in the swinging red door. It didn't provide much insight into what was happening as it was covered with thick steam. Probably from the cooking, I thought as I pushed the door and stepped into the kitchen. It took a while for my eyes to get used to the fluctuating lights, but when I did, that's when I saw it. There was red plastered all over the wall. I felt my stomach churn even as my legs threatened to give up. There was no chef, no waiters, just red everywhere. And an amputated hand wearing a golden bracelet with the heart in the middle hanging from the ceiling. I took two breaths to quiet the rambling thoughts in my head. It wasn't totally silent, but I dragged myself out of the kitchen, grabbed Leslie's hand, and pulled her along with me. We need to leave, I said to her. Leslie tried to find out what I had seen, but there was no time to explain. Now! I shouted as I pushed through the crowd of confused patrons to get to the entrance. We stopped the cab and urged him to begin driving before he could even register where we were going. What the fuck is happening, Ethan? I don't know. I answered. We weren't far from the restaurant when I began hearing the wails of people from behind. Chapter 3 I woke up with a deafening ring in both ears that got louder as the seconds trickled by. A constant reminder that I was no longer unconscious and everything that came before hadn't been a dream. With the ringing still blaring from both ears, trying to move was an uphill battle. Even more so since I was hanging upside down, held only by the seatbelt. Leslie convinced me to wear it at the last moment. I could feel something rushing to the top of my head. Blood. I couldn't tell if it was internal or not. It took me almost an eternity to undo the seatbelt, causing my body to dash into the shards of glass strewn about. It didn't take long before I felt the wetness from my torso and leg. I stayed there for a while as pain radiated throughout my body. To distract from it, I turned my neck as far as I could, only to see the cab driver whose head was bent into a position not compatible with living. That was when it hit me. Leslie. She was beside me when the sudden earthquake threw everything on its head. Where was she? I tried shouting her name, but the fall knocked the wind out of me. I only began to move minutes after. Slowly, I flipped myself onto my stomach and crawled through the window, cutting myself further as I dragged my body along the ragged remains of the door window. Using the flip cab as a support, I pushed myself to my feet and looked around for any sign of Leslie. Everywhere I looked was characterized by one word. Chaos. The entire street was filled with toppled cars, crumbling structures, and groans of pain that inspired confusion and panic. How long was I out for? Midway into surveying the area, I noticed something queer. I checked my phone to be certain and I was right. The time was 9 p.m. The sky was meant to be a dark canvas filled with dotting lights. But somehow, the night was as bright as day. I stumbled backward to the ground after looking up. There was a streak of fire running across the sky. What the fuck was happening? I thought to myself even as Edward's words rang through my mind. 
Finding my bearing was difficult, taking several tries to get on my knees. Barely able to stand on my feet, I decided to trace the trail of blood originating from the cab. Following the trail led me to a clearing free from the chaotic blend of tumbled cars and crumbling buildings. It still held the groan and murmur of pain and confusion. In front of me was a blindfolded crowd tied to the ground. My resolve to keep my distance melted away when I spotted her amongst the captured people. I looked everywhere for a sign of the capturers, and when I found none, I rushed in as fast as possible, as fast as I could with an injured leg. I rushed to Leslie, removed the blindfold, and urged her to remain calm as I tried to undo her restraints. I had first thought it to be a rope, but it wasn't. There was a lot of noise, but I could still hear each heartbeat as I continued my futile attempt to free her from her restraint. I was still trying to undo the restraints when Leslie spoke up. You need to leave here, Ethan. Please, before they find you. I looked up and saw tears rushing down her cheeks. Who did this to you? Maybe I could talk to them. Give them something in exchange for your freedom. They must want something. You can't give them anything. I was about to say something else when Leslie spoke up. Ethan, you need to leave now. Now. They're coming. I wasn't going to leave Leslie. I'd come this far and wouldn't leave without her. I turned around to face these cruel humans down. They'd have to kill me if they wanted to take Leslie. I was still waiting when I heard the inset of the horn. It began slowly until it grew loud enough to be mistaken for thunder in the sky. Still reeling from the horn orchestra in my head, I turned my head around when someone walked into the clearing. I had difficulty concentrating through the sounds in my head and the sight of the person in front of me. It was no human. It stood above seven feet, with two inclined slits, trailing a bony structure on its face's sides. I recognized that smell before. It was when I bumped into Edward. I was still wondering what I was looking at when Leslie shouted from behind and told me to run. If they catch you, they will kill you! It was difficult leaving Leslie. I was going to stand my ground before she accused me of being stupid for not running before they caught me. I promised I would return before running into the building closest to the clearing as cuts and bruises prevented me from going further. I limped into the building as the now shadowed figures followed from behind. I made it further into the building before catching a glimpse at the elevator across the hall. I couldn't be certain there was any power, but it was the fastest way away from these creatures on my trail, so I took a chance. The door was easier to pry open than expected. I stepped into it and repeatedly tapped the button for the highest level, even as the strange creatures closed the gap between us. I was beginning to fear that this was the end, when the elevator began its ascent. I leaned against the guardrail to catch my breath, as I couldn't imagine going further at my current pace. I was still urging the hum in my head away when the elevator stopped abruptly, and the lights went out. Had the power gone out? I wasn't through with the thought, when the blade came slicing through the elevator door as if it was paper. The blade cut through the door, the control panel, and some of the largest wirings I had seen on an elevator. In front of me was one of the things. It was hard to tell if it was an alien or something else. Not that I had much time to think about it, as it grabbed me and banged against the wall several times till my legs gave out. It raised me with a fraction of a speed and effort. It was about to stab me when I pushed into the wires behind it, causing wild sparks to fly. Enough time to run, so I did. Away from the elevator, I moved to another room as fast as compared to the heavy footsteps behind me. The hum had died off, but all the questions I couldn't ask stood in its place. It was getting colder. I could see my breath now. I hid behind a wall, with my hand placed over my leg, only for me to look behind to see a trail of blood. Shit, I thought. This was a line leading them straight to me. I cut out my shirt, tied it around my leg, propped myself up and continued going. I could hear the footsteps everywhere now. How many of them were inside the building? It had taken luck to beat one of them. I was not sure I could face another and come out alive. Although uncertain how it would help, I picked up a rod from the ground and continued up the stairs. Halfway through the stairs, I heard the sound from the top, 
causing me to run down an aisle of cold and darkness. The footsteps got close with every passing second. I threw my right hand over my mouth to stop anything from getting out. I would have liked to say it helped, but it didn't. I moved away from the spot when I began to hear sounds that sounded like words without any meaning. Peeking from my cover, I saw it was headed for me. It was now or never. I charged at it with the intent of putting the rod into it. It was only up close when I then realized how foolhardy my original plan was. The rod broke on impact, and as it came closer, I realized it was the same one from the elevator. I ran, but it got me, and was about to launch the blade into me when the hum began. I could feel the threads holding my brain, threatening to fall apart. It looked at me with its eyes, grabbed me and jumped out from the window, and dropped me at the clearing I started from. The crowd was still there, but with one major difference, chained up together, and they were floating now. Not only could I hear the screams, and I could feel the pain too, as my feet were no longer on the ground and were now in the air. An enormous force pressed into me from all angles. I was convinced I was going to pop when I fell flat on my face. I turned on my back, looked up at the sky, and saw that every crevice of darkness was gone, and the streak of fire had multiplied, forming various streaks of parallel fires revolving around the sky. In the middle of it was a big, floating geometrical shape. I watched as the streaks broke the revolving pattern and flowed to the ship. The hum died out, and everything went dark. Although most of my body was numb, I could feel myself being dragged through the asphalt. The grip holding the helm of my cloth was tight, and my weak attempt at undoing it was met with futility. How was I going to meet my end? Would it be quick? Or would my body be splattered everywhere? My thoughts were cut short as I slipped into unconsciousness. The world, the entire universe, swirled around me until it became even faster with each revolution. That's when I saw Leslie's face. She was calling out to me, and for a moment, it was real. As real as anything could be at that point but it didn't last as something bumped over my head. I woke with a start even as I surveyed the surrounding around me. It wasn't one I recognized. How long had I been out? And where was I? I was still mulling the questions when I became aware of two things. First was the man looking at me and the cold that covered everywhere. It took me a while before I realized who it was. Edward. I had a million questions. The first of them was, where was Leslie? And did she make it? You don't remember what happened? He asked. I thought about it for a second before the memory came flashing back in my mind. My stomach churned, but I couldn't throw up as I hadn't eaten anything in what was probably a while. Setting up too quickly had caused me to experience a spell of vertigo, but after it passed, I asked Edward to show me the path they went in so I could rescue her. I still remember the look on his face when he looked up and told me that I wouldn't be able to do anything now. I stumbled back upon receiving the news, still hellbent on going. He pulled me back and pointed at the innards of what I would later come to know was a bunker. The world, as you know, has ended, he said. He explained to me that the things that attacked Earth were the creators of our star. It was an outstation a power source to use whenever they get stuck in their travels. They were Prometheus, reclaiming the fire they gifted us. Humans, Edward claimed, were just a byproduct of the decision. To enable them to take up all that energy, they needed a particular element found in us to get the process going. They took it all and left, he said. Edward had to explain it several times before I understood it. The cold the destruction, the end. I was never going to see the sun again. I was never going to see Leslie, nor anyone else I love. Hey, sci-fi horror fans, it's Keon. Thanks for listening tonight. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below. 
Also, if you'd like to officially support the Dark Cosmos, you can do so by clicking the join button. Membership starts at $5 only. And remember, stay cosmic. The Dark Cosmos presents The Life Eater Written by Moonlight Hunter Welcome cosmic beings, it's Keon, tonight's narrator. Enjoy tonight's sci-fi horror story, and remember, stay cosmic. Chapter 1 Dead Eagle Far out in Cape Canaveral, between Jacksonville to the north and Miami to the south, an urgent meeting was taking place. The Situation Room at the Kennedy Space Center was buzzing with mild chatters as astronauts, scientists, engineers, IT specialists, human resource specialists, accountants, writers, technicians, and many other professional people chattered between themselves. These collective set of individuals were all working together at NASA to break barriers and achieve the seemingly impossible. Space exploration. A few minutes later, the chief administrator of the space program and his deputy waltzed into the room. The chattering voices tuned down to hushed whispering as both men took their seat. They gazed out at the crowd of nearly 200 before them. It was these people that kept the space station operational. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. John Bernard, the chief administrator of operations, cleared his throat and adjusted the frame of his horn-rimmed glasses. He was a slender-looking man in his late fifties, with a bald head and a scruff of a mustache atop his lips. A few of the employees murmured back a greeting. Others stayed silent as they waited for confirmation from the chief administrator of the space station. The possibility of an impending mission kept most of the employees on edge. As you all know, a couple of decades ago, we lost two of our finest astronauts in the unfortunate mission to the dark side of the moon, dubbed Dead Eagle. He paused, glancing around the room that was now dead silent, before he went on. It should also be known that the bodies of these astronauts were never recovered from the wreckage of the crash, and because of that, these heroes of science were never given a proper burial. No one spoke. A sea of eyes beseeched the administrator with rapt attention. Now, I just had a meeting with the president, and after a lengthy conversation, we had decided to conduct a rescue mission back to the moon in order to retrieve the bodies of these heroes of science. It's time we give them a fitting burial here on Earth. The room erupted in a cacophony of chattering and murmuring employees as they all began to discuss how such a mission was possible. Contrary to popular belief, it was of general knowledge to everyone at the space station that the Apollo missions from 8 onwards were staged with practical effects. They had been quite successful over the years. Most citizens believed wholeheartedly that man had been to the moon. The real attempt to send the man to the moon, now called Dead Eagle, was a devastating failure for NASA. The mission failed cataclysmically, without any survivors. Communications with the spacecraft had been totally lost the moment they approached the moon's orbit, where the crashed remains of their pod floated for eternity. John Bernard sighed before holding up his arm. The quorum returned to the room for a brief moment. Now, I know what most of you are probably thinking, that this is going to be another suicide mission. But I can assure you, that isn't going to be the case. As you all are also aware, we are much more technologically advanced now. Somebody raised an arm amongst the seated employees, and John signaled for him to speak. He had known beforehand that he was going to be bombarded with a plethora of questions in regards to his visit to Washington to see the president. Excuse me, sir, but if what you're saying is correct, then not only are we going to the dark side of the moon in search of a crashed spacecraft from almost half a century ago, but we're also going to be retrieving the bodies of these great astronauts? 
A redhead woman draped in a lab coat inquired. Yes, Miss Amelia. Mr. Bernard quickly replied. So, what's the guarantee that the bodies of these astronauts haven't drifted off into space? She quipped. The room fell silent. <clears throat> Mr. Bernard cleared his throat and gave his deputy a slide nod, and after a quick swipe on the iPad in his hand, the projector at the end of the room began to play a video. It was live footage from the crashed spacecraft. A few gasps echoed in the room as the frame switched to the control room of the crashed spacecraft. There, two bodies in spacesuits floated aimlessly around the confines of the dead machine. One of the astronauts was still strapped to his seat. His helmet banged repeatedly against the roof of the spacecraft due to the lack of gravity. This is live feed being transmitted from the ISS. A robotic camera was deployed to inspect the wreckage and found this. Mr. Bernard gestured towards the screen. A dull, eerie thudding sound emanated repeatedly as the astronaut's helmet tapped against the metal roof of the craft's cabin. The astronaut's partner floated back and forth within the confines of the chamber. Mr. Bernard gave his deputy another nod and the video was cut off, returning everyone's attention back to him. Even though we all know what we just saw is a grim contrast to our hoisted flag on the moon, we're embarking on this mission to pay our final respects to these men and their families. We want to show the world that we're not ashamed of honoring our heroes and the legacy they left us. The silence in the room suggested everyone now grasped the importance of the mission at hand. After asking for further questions which weren't forthcoming, Mr. Bernard brought the meeting to a close. We leave for the dark side of the moon in the next 30 days. He announced, standing up and exiting the room. Kitty Hawk approaching Dead Eagle wreckage. An astronaut said as he hopped towards the remains of the Dead Eagle spacecraft. A new set of astronauts had arrived on the moon to retrieve the remaining bodies and were now bouncing against the rigid surface of the moon. It looked like they were in a bouncy castle, hurling themselves towards the wrecked spacecraft. The newly arrived astronauts both had body cameras attached to their respective suits, transmitting live feed of the mission to members of their team on Earth while their shuttle was docked at the ISS. Okay, boys. Nice and easy. Mr. Bernard's voice echoed over the radio in their helmets. One of the astronauts was firmly clutching a crowbar. He approached the mangled, jammed door of the spacecraft and after a few seconds was able to pry it open. He and his partner carefully entered the cabin of the ship. Commander Bernard and a team of engineers monitoring each second of the mission back at the command base were now transfixed by the screens before them. They watched as the astronauts began struggling to cut their unfortunate colleagues loose. When they were done with that, they bound both bodies tightly with another cable cord while one of the astronauts glanced around the pitch dark cabin with a mini flashlight. Okay, we've got it. Let's go. The other astronaut said as he held onto the bodies, trying to prevent them from floating out of the open door. What the hell is that? The astronaut aimed his torch and stared at what looked like a static black rock floating right inside the cabin. Huh? The second astronaut squinted behind his helmet as he stared at the object that was just a few feet away from him. It was so conspicuous and easy to miss, if not for the flashlight his colleague brought along. Kitty Hawk, do we have a problem? Commander Bernard asked. He could barely see anything out of place. Of course, he was thousands of miles away in the command center on Earth, but still, what were they looking at? The second astronaut sounded gobsmacked. He moved closer towards the dark rock, waving his flashlight over the object. Kitty Hawk, I repeat, what is the situation? An anxious Bernard asked through the radio comms. It looks like some kind of rock. One of the astronauts echoed in awe. He poked at the piece of rock. It didn't float around like other objects in space. Instead, 
It simply hung conspicuously in the cabin, acting almost like a small black hole. The crazy thing is, how did we get in here? One astronaut asked. The hull of the ship is in and we literally had to break our way in. What was puzzling and even more strange to both the astronauts and the team back on Earth was that even if space debris were to somehow get into the metal cabin, why was it just a particular dark piece of rock? The astronauts tried in vain to move it, so how did it float in the cabin? If they couldn't move it now, how had it moved itself? There definitely had to be other pieces of rock floating around the cabin too if the one they were staring at had somehow gotten inside from an opening. All right, that's enough, boys. Let's stay focused to the mission at hand and bring those fine men back home. Commander Bernard's voice echoed over the radio, snapping both astronauts from their transfixed reverie. Back at the Kennedy Space Station, he stared long and hard at a freeze image of the tiny rock so dark it could be barely perceived as a three-dimensional object by human eyes. He watched as the crew of astronauts began to float towards the door, and he got an idea. Try grabbing that rock and bring it along with you. He spoke into the microphone beside him. One of the astronauts nodded. The ground crew watched in silence while the astronauts simply plucked the rock from where it hung. Both men began their journey back to the ISS, with the corpses firmly bound between them. The astronauts soon arrived at the ISS, and a few days later, were preparing for re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. In line with NASA's theoretical triangulation of the mission, a Navy fleet was already waiting out in the Pacific Sea, anticipating the re-entry of the space capsule. It was supposed to crash land into the sea upon re-entry. A few minutes later, the descending capsule was visible with a huge fireball shrouding it. The capsule pierced down through the Earth's atmospheric fields at breakneck speed before hitting the water. Divers were quickly dispatched, and the astronauts were saved, alongside the corpses they went to retrieve. It had been a successful mission, and the Kennedy Control Center erupted in cheers at the news. Bernard quickly phoned the president to inform him of the news, making sure to mention the strange rock. The fanfare that accompanied the return of the dead astronauts could easily be mistaken for a 4th of July celebration, as hundreds of thousands of citizens thronged the streets across the country to pay their last respects to the heroes. The president declared the flag to be flown at half-mast on the day the dead astronauts were finally let down into the belly of the Earth after floating in space for decades. The president called for a meeting with the commander of NASA and Mr. Bernard paid another visit to Washington to brief the president on the discovery of the rock. The president's interest was piqued by the discovery of the space rock, and he ordered for the commander to send a piece of rock to a dumb or deep underground military base located out in Utah for an in-depth research to be carried out on it. Chapter 2 Dark Moon it was another day at the museum, another day to work on the Black Rock. One would expect that the museum curator, Mr. Martin Stevens, or Marty as he was fondly called, would get tired, or, at the very least, bored of staring at one rock for close to ten years. Nine years and seven months to be exact. That's how long he'd been studying this rock. At first glance, it was Vanta Black. But upon closer inspection, it was something more. It couldn't be explained, at least not yet. But there were scientists who had devoted the rest of their lives to understanding it, and Marty was just about ready to spend his entire life waiting for them. This was bigger than him. To Marty, this was bigger than the world. Who knew what their findings would be? Who knew what they would lead to? So, every day since the little black rock had been handed over to him, Marty devoted every second following the scientists' research. So far, they had discovered that the rock's surface absorbed 100% of any light that fell on it. Once disintegrated, it was found that the inside of the rock had properties of regular rocks, 
Several extensive tests were carried out, but nothing spectacular was found. It all ended at the surface. Another fascinating property about the rock was that no matter how many tiny bits they broke it into, each piece would have the properties of the entire rock, including the light-absorbing surface. This was too rare an occurrence to pass up. For these scientists, it wasn't even about fame or glory. It was plain, undiluted curiosity that drove them. Marty was beyond ecstatic that the government granted his museum an exclusive license to show the rock fragments, and he followed up on every single piece of information that was unearthed concerning the rock. A creature of habit, Marty walked in through the museum doors at exactly 8 a.m., greeting the doorman with his signature smile and a nod of his balding head. He didn't need to speak. He never had time to, unless it was absolutely necessary. His smile-nod combination was enough to make people know he wasn't a rude man, just a busy one. He walked as briskly as he could in his three-piece suit, standing regally straight despite his protruding stomach. He reached his office in exactly 15 minutes, then leafed through the correspondence left for him by his secretary. His assistant walked in exactly five minutes later with his cup of coffee. Good morning, Mr. Stevens. Nathan Eaves was the only one in the world who called him that. Good morning, Nathan. He responded with a small smile. Here's your coffee, sir. Nathan said, dropping the cup at his boss's elbow, even though he knew the man wouldn't drink it. Exactly ten minutes after, Marty stood up and left the office for the lab. He shrugged off his suit and hung it neatly in a locker, changing into his golf shirt and slacks before pulling on a lab coat. It made Marty smile, remembering how his wife would nag him for wearing an expensive suit to work only to change into golf wear later. The truth was, he felt more at ease in his golf wear, but he had to look the part of a successful museum curator hence the suit. After he changed, he reached for the bottled water he knew Nathan always kept there for him. After taking a healthy gulp, he settled down to watch the footage of the space expedition that showed the arrival of the Dead Eagle rescue mission for what would be the upteenth time. No one would disturb him. If there was anything wrong, Nathan was capable of handling it. It all worked like a well-winded clock just as it has for the past 23 years, until the footage began to play and voices filled the room. By now, Marty could recite every word in the footage. He knew what would happen with each second, and he already had the faces of the scientists etched in his mind. So it took him a good 30 minutes to spot something wrong with the footage. At first, it was just a feeling, a feeling that something was off but he just couldn't put his finger on it. He hunched closer to the screen, frown lines marrying his face. And then he saw it. He saw himself. One of the scientists in the footage was him, or at least had his face. Marty had gone through the footage at least three times every day since he got it, so he knew that none of the scientists bore even the slightest resemblance to him. So how could this be? One of the others must have tampered with the footage. That was the only explanation. Maybe they were playing a prank on him? Was today his birthday? He always forgot the date and had to depend on his wife to send him flowers or organize a surprise birthday before he remembered. Now that he thought about it, Evelyn was just mischievous enough to have done something like this. He could bet his degree that she put Nathan up to it. The young man looked as innocent as a newborn, but he was as crafty as the devil. Still chuckling, he got up from his chair. He was going to let Nathan know the error of his ways. Then he would call his wife. He didn't know what he would do with, or to her yet, but he would soon. He walked down the floor below where the offices were located, and then got to Nathan's office. Say, Nate, did you by any chance mess with the black rock footage? He asked with narrowed eyes and a voice he hoped was serious, even though he could hear the laughter in it. Nathan, however, kept his eyes on his computer, not even sparing him a glance. Marty was convinced now that his assistant was guilty as charged and he smiled. Oh, so that's how you want to play it? He asked, 
approaching the man's desk. Tell me, did Evie put you up to this? He leaned on the table. What's in it for you? How much did she pay you to turn on me? Still, Nathan didn't look at him. There wasn't even the slightest indication that his assistant had heard him. A slight irritation worked through Marty, but he tried to keep his voice light. It was a joke after all. Nathan Eves, your boss is talking to you, he said. Still, Nathan didn't turn to him. He opened his mouth to say something else when one of the other staff knocked and walked into the office. Mr. Eves, she called, and he looked up. Marty turned to see that it was his secretary, but she didn't acknowledge him. Your 9.30 is here, she continued. Nathan frowned and looked at his wristwatch, then at the wall clock. But it's barely 9.30. What's the hurry? The secretary merely smiled at him in response. Tell him I'll be down shortly and have refreshments sent to him. Okay, sir. She made to turn before Nathan stopped her. Lisa? He called. Yes, sir? She responded with raised brows. You know you can call me Nathan like everyone else, right? He asked with a soft smile. A smile that made Marty give him a suspicious look. Or better yet, Nate. That's what my friends call me. And Mr. Stevens, Lisa said with a smile of her own. Well, yeah. He finished with a boyish shrug. There was silence in the office for a while. And then Lisa said, I hear you, Mr. Eves. Then she offered him an innocent smile and left the room, leaving Nathan grinning. Is there something I should be worried about? Marty asked, but Nathan just sat back in his chair, staring dreamily at the spot where Lisa had been standing a few minutes ago. Hey boy, I'm talking to you, Marty said, moving in Nathan's line of sight. But the man seemed to look straight through him. Marty decided he'd had enough. Okay. I think this has gone on long enough, Nathan. Look at me. I'm talking to you. Nathan took a deep breath and Marty thought he'd finally come to his senses. Instead, the man shut down his computer and stood up, put on his suit jacket, and started walking around his table while he fixed the buttons. Marty moved right in his path. Where do you think you're going, Nathan? What sort of... The words died in his throat when Nathan simply walked through him. Nathan walked through him like he was thin air, like he didn't even exist. Marty's heart raced and his mind went blank. He had to sit down for a bit or he would kill over from shock. What just happened? Nathan had just... How was that possible? The wheels in his brain began turning. Slowly though, but it was a start. Lisa had also been in the office and she hadn't acted as though she had seen him. What if she really didn't? And Nathan, the boy had worked as Marty's personal assistant for over seven years, and despite a few disagreements here and there, he had never disrespected him even once. His virtues were not the kind a person could hide for a long time. So, did it mean that he really couldn't see Marty? He could see him just about an hour ago. He brought him his coffee for crying out loud. So what happened? His heart skipped several beats, and he had to work twice as hard to stay calm. He needed to think, so he needed to keep a clear head. Nathan had brought Marty's coffin for him in his office, even spoke to him, so there was no doubt that he could see him then. Then, Marty had gone to the lab, exchanged his suit for something more comfortable before he started watching the video and noticed himself in it. Marty sat up straight as a thought occurred to him. If he assumed this all was real, that it wasn't a joke, or some well-thought-out and well-delivered prank, his being in a footage from 10 years ago would mean that he was there when the footage was recorded. It would mean that he was part of the mission to retrieve the casualties from the dead eagle. It meant that he was there when the black stone was found. But Martin Stevens knew that he was not there. In fact, he was in the hospital, waiting for news of his newborn daughters. It was a thing amongst them now, relating the birth of the girls to the discovery of a special rock. It was an omen of how special they were. So why was he in the footage? And most importantly, why was he invisible? 
he decided to take a walk through the museum. Maybe someone would see him, maybe one of the visitors. If this was a prank, there's no way they would be on it unless every single one of them was hired by his wife, and that was too extreme, even for her. So he left Nathan's office for a walk through the museum, and in less than 20 minutes, he had gotten his proof. He was dizzy with shock and anxiety, and he knew that if he were to fall to the ground right there in the middle of the museum, no one would notice. They would simply walk over him without even noticing. More than a handful of people had walked through him already. He pulled himself to the nearest elevator, with people occupying his space as if he was just air. But he was, wasn't he? At least to them, he was just air. He would have found the whole thing amazing if he weren't so scared. Everyone now looked like they were from an old movie. If he wasn't still in the museum, he might have been lost or confused. Maybe it was a side effect of the whatever it was that was happening to him. During the elevator ride, he remembered the black rock. He remembered the awe and power he felt when he held it. It was like holding a vacuum in his hand, a very heavy vacuum. They had told him that it was just floating in the air, suspended since it didn't move around like the other materials in space. He remembered how he staggered under its weight, partly because he didn't expect it to weigh so much. The elevator stopped on the last floor accessible to visitors. He stepped out and more memories of the fragmentation process flooded his mind. He... Wait. How could he remember? He wasn't even there when the rock was fragmented. How could he remember? And it wasn't just his mind. Every part of him seemed to believe the same thing. He could still feel the weight of the rock on his hands. He could still remember the thoughts that ran through his mind when he broke the rocks. He could hear the awed gasps of his colleagues as they examined the black rock. Except it wasn't him. All these memories did not belong to him. So how could they be in his head? He hadn't even solved one problem and he was already facing another. Sweat dripped down his forehead as he made his way up the stairs. When he reached the office floor, he rested on the steps. Maybe it was best he knew everything at once. That way, he knew what exactly he was facing and he could solve this once and for all. But first, he could call his wife. She would know what to do, or at the very least, she would calm him down. As the thought crossed his mind, he knew that there was a very slim chance of success, but he would try anyway. He drew strength from hope and made his way to the last floor where the laboratory was located. But as soon as he reached it, he found himself in a completely different place. It was a laboratory, but not like the one in the museum. While that one was just equipped for examining antiques and rocks to be sure of their authenticity, this one was a real laboratory. Even worse, he remembered this lab. It was where he had analyzed the rock. No, it was where the man whose memories he now had, had analyzed the rock. In fact, it had just been an instant since the rock was fragmented. So where was everyone? Marty at least expected to find someone here. Maybe they could help him explain what was going on, or maybe not but he knew there were supposed to be people here. Did the other man also share his memories too? Or was this one-sided? He looked around to see that all the other labs were illuminated, but he didn't know where the light came from. It was dark outside, so it couldn't be from the sun, and it was of no artificial origin that he could see. What is this? He muttered to himself not caring that his voice was shaking. What is going on here? He half expected someone to appear and give him an answer. He'd be happy with that, no matter how ludicrous the answer was. At least, he would have an answer in the company of another human. But when that didn't happen, he lost it. He started running through the building for the exit. He didn't know how, but he knew where the exit was and he was going to get out of the building. As he ran, the corridor seemed to stretch ahead of him, but he wouldn't stop running. 
Marty gave it all he had until the corridor disappeared altogether and he was on a deserted plane. It was dark and Marty felt as though he was in a vacuum. There was a loud silence. Even his tinnitus was gone. The silence seemed to press into his brain and he wanted to scream, not out of pain but out of fear. But Marty couldn't scream. He couldn't open his mouth to make the sound. Inwards, he was screeching and yelling, but outwardly, he looked calm, expressionless. The moon itself was like the dark rock, pinned to the velvet dark sky, slowly increasing in size. He saw an astronaut looking at the dead eagle spacecraft that was stuck in the sand. The hatch opened. Finally, someone who could help. Marty ran to the astronaut as fast as his legs could carry him. But when he touched the astronaut's shoulder, the astronaut collapsed on the floor. It was just an empty suit. At this point, he was past despair and he was running on adrenaline and instinct. He decided to enter the dead ego, but when he fell inside it, he found himself floating in a void. Looking around, he saw that he had a view of himself inside the laboratory, moving towards the light switch to turn it off. The dark rock was once again intact. It was in that moment that he had a glimpse of understanding. The dream is fading. The dream that one day we existed in an infinite universe. The dream that darkness was torn by light at the beginning of all things. He wondered if every single person in the world was also alone in this final moment. The light switch went off. And then, he was no more. Chapter 3 Devoid The end is nigh! The end is nigh! The man kept yelling at the top of his voice, already made hoarse from years and years of yelling. He looked homeless, with his messy beard and ill-fitting clothes, but he didn't smell homeless. He didn't smell particularly nice, and while his clothes didn't fit well, they were clean. A clear indication that he took care of himself. He was a tall man, with strong, long arms that held up a wooden board, showing his message. The end is nigh. What was most peculiar about this man was that for well over seven years, he had been proclaiming the same message. Nothing more, nothing less. Residents say that he's been at it for much longer. But while most messengers like him proclaim the rapture or the second coming of the Christ, this man proclaimed an entirely different message, claiming that a cosmic entity was looking for what was taken from her a long time ago. With a message like this, it is no surprise that people mocked him. It was also not a surprise when people started taking him seriously. If one man could keep screaming the same thing over and over for years, maybe there was some truth to it. And this message definitely appealed to those who had been in a lifelong search for their higher calling and true purpose. Soon, it became a movement, gathering more and more members who called themselves followers of the messenger. These followers were devout people who all but lived on every word of the bearded man, who they dubbed the messenger, for that was what he was. No one knew his name or anything about him. No one cared to ask, and this shrouded him in an aura of mystery, which somehow endeared him to his followers even more. They started having gatherings in a small warehouse, but soon the crowd grew larger. One of the richer members paid extra for a larger space to accommodate the extra people. It was a whole new movement, a whole new religion. They didn't concern themselves much with luxury or comfort. The world was ending after all. What they concerned themselves with was the Void, the cosmic entity that spoke to the messenger's mind. She was looking for the one who took from her long, long ago. So far, that was all the messenger knew. And it was agreed that if they all quieted their minds and their spirits, they could hear more from the Void. For certainly, she must be trying to speak to them again. Maybe she'd been speaking all these years, but the messenger had not been able to hear because his spirit and mind weren't at peace and in sync with the universe. 
For this reason, when the followers gathered, there was not a single sound to be heard. If someone was listening in, they would think all of them were dead or maybe asleep. But the followers reached for the voice of the void with their minds. It was one evening during their meditations that the messenger heard the voice. It was like a soft breeze, a memory long forgotten. He instinctively reached for it, willing himself at the same time to block it out, just to be sure it really was devoid. The voice, soft as it was, pushed through his resistance. It existed before, and will exist after all things. The voice whispered, coiling around his mind like a python, teasing its prey. The messenger muttered the words in a half-unconscious state, completely unaware of himself. The followers hung on to every word. The absolute silence in the hall made it possible to hear the faintest murmur echoing off the walls. So when the messenger started speaking, despite how low his voice was, they heard him and gathered round to listen. One woman took it upon herself to write down the words while the rest listened in awe. He was once everywhere, and now is nowhere. The voice said again. There was sadness in the voice, a deep, overwhelming sadness, underlined with an anger that promised mad vengeance. The messenger, even in his state of unconsciousness, felt a chilling fear in his bones, but for some reason, he couldn't run or scream or cry or even beg. He was frozen before the voice that spoke from the darkness. He is mine, just as I am his, and without him, I am not. Now, there was an obvious agitation in the voice. It shook with each word. Devoid was scared, but of what? He wanted to ask. Surely, if she could speak to him, he could speak right back. There must have been something that made her choose him in the first place. He tried to ask how he might help. But his mouth was full of cotton, and his tongue glued to the roof of his mouth. Even his lips had been soon shut, so speaking was now impossible. He felt the void slither to and from in his head, and he knew she was pacing. Strange, since he couldn't see her, couldn't see anything but the deep darkness, not even the slightest shadow. But he knew, he could feel her emotions like they were his. See every action in his mind's eye, every cock of the head, every side glance, every narrowed eye, but he could never make out her face. Strange, strange indeed. She was angry all right, angry enough to destroy the world, but she was worried. Beneath the thick and numerous layers of anger, there were even more layers of worry and anxiety. She needed to find him, it, whatever she was looking for. The messenger knew that it was this worry that kept her wrath at bay. Whatever or whoever she was looking for, she needed to know they were safe and that they were here before she did anything rash. Just like witch smoke, the void vanished, as if she wasn't even there to start with. And then again, she was never really there, was she? It was an old memory, one he could not even remember anymore now. It was all in his mind. He was suddenly out of strength. He needed to lie down. So he opened his eyes and froze as he saw numerous pairs of wide eyes sitting in a circle around him. He stared at the woman sitting just before him, the one who had written down his mumblings, and she stared back, not daring to speak until she was spoken to. When he made no move or said anything, the woman silently held out the piece of paper towards him with both hands and he took it from her and read. The words trickled into his head like dewdrops and with each one, he heard her voice again. He couldn't really tell where his voice ended and where hers began. There were two streams flowing into and through one another, so it was real after all. The void had spoken to him again after all these years. He froze instantly as a thought occurred to him. If the memory was not just a memory, then all the feelings, all those emotions, she really was going to destroy them all. He had known of this for a long time, of course, but now it felt so real. He had felt her power, felt her rage, 
and he knew that whenever she found what she was looking for, none of them would have the slightest chance of surviving. The followers had also noticed his reaction, and one of them finally dared to speak. Tell us what's to come, messenger. It was barely a whisper, but it carried. The messenger sighed and then said clearly, The end is nigh. The announcement was like a heavy rock thrown into a river. They had all known that destruction was inevitable, but it was not until this point that they realized that they had hoped it wasn't so. Hope that it would be averted. Hope that there was a way to save the faithful. Hope that something, anything, would turn out in their favor. This was it. The end was nigh. The messenger stood up, like the stalk of an upturned flower, in the very midst of those gathered around him, and looked straight at the exit. His intention was clearly written on his face, and his followers began to part before him to make way. He walked silently, solemnly, and picked up the large placard just by the door before he stepped out. A short while later, his voice could be heard, bellowing his first and only message. The end is nigh! The end is nigh! The end is nigh! This time, there was a passion to it, an urgency that could only be possessed by one who knew, one who had seen the end of which he spoke of. His followers gathered at the door and windows to stare at their leader, each torn between sadness and fear and the bravery to take up a placard and stand beside him. The end be damned. Some passers-by pointed at and mocked him. Oi, put a sock on it, will ya? One said as he walked past. Go get a life, another said. Mothers pulled their children closer to them, away from the crazy man shouting nonsense. Teenagers threw half-eaten fruits and snacks at him, but the messenger would not be discouraged. Even the followers who were there when the message came couldn't muster such courage, so they stared. She's looking for what was taken from her long ago! He yelled again at the small crowd that was beginning to form. Some of them already had their phones out, recording videos. <laughs> oh yeah? One pot-bellied man asked. What exactly is that? Then he repeated all that he had heard with such vehemence that had spittle flying out of his mouth. Some people seemed convinced, those who'd known the man since he first took to the streets. Some were skeptical, some laughed at him, and others pitied him. The reactions were not a bother to him. He'd gotten the word out. It was now planted in their minds. There was nothing him and his followers or anyone else could do but prepare and wait. They could only take solace in their loved ones and leave each day like it was their last. For one of these days may very well be. The rock! The black rock belongs to the void! He kept saying. Of course, everyone had heard of the unique rock that was found in space ten years ago. They'd heard that it was like no other. Pieces of it were in museums, while others were still being examined. But what did that have to do with anything this man said? People murmured amongst themselves, and he pushed on. They didn't tell you everything, he said with a grave voice. They don't even know everything. They have taken what belongs to another, what was never theirs to take in the first place. And now, we will all pay for it. You mark my words. Your children, your wives, your husbands, your friends, your mother, and your father, uncles, and aunts will all be gone. And you won't even be here to feel the loss, for you will be gone as well. While he still spoke, he looked up and saw the moon rising. Dread washed over him like a bucket of ice water. It was still too early for the moon to come out. With the recent message, this could not be any mere coincidence. He watched as the dark mass, which was too dark to be the moon, grew bigger and bigger, casting its shadow over the horizon. She's here, he whispered as he watched the darkness grow larger and larger. She's here! He said again, louder now, but when he looked around, he saw that he was alone. He spun around and saw that all the followers who were gathered behind him were gone too. He was left all alone, and he knew that it was only so he could see the end come before 
It took him too. Shit, was the last word he got out. And then he was no more. Chapter 4 Eclipse This chapter contains strong violence. Viewer discretion is advised. It was 8 in the morning on a beautiful Tuesday, but of course, Myron Bennett couldn't appreciate the view because his curtains were drawn. He hated sunlight. He lived alone in his grandmother's house. It was the house he had lived in all his life since his mother ran away after giving birth to him. As much as the old woman took care of him, she was a shrew. She never made him forget that he owed her the very air he breathed screeching at him every second she was awake. When he misbehaved, or whenever she felt like it, she would whack him behind the head with a wooden spatula. It was always with a wooden spatula. Myron was a miserable kid, and school wasn't any better. He was always bullied because of how scrawny he looked, and he was failing all his classes. It was as if the world was against him, and he was powerless to do anything. His head was always pounding with a headache that wouldn't go away. His chest always hurt. And every time no one was looking, a tear would slip. It was all too much, and he just wanted it to end. After a long thought, he decided he was going to kill himself. The world was too cruel and merciless to him, and he'd had enough. He decided it was going to be on a Saturday, since it was the last day of the week. It was fitting that it would be the last day of his life. He was also born on a Saturday, so it was fitting all round that he should die on Saturday. His grandmother always went grocery shopping on Saturdays while he had to clean the house. He was expected to be done before she came home from shopping, or there would be hell to pay. This Saturday, however, he wouldn't do anything. It would bring him satisfaction to know that on his last day, He'd very deliberately annoyed the old hag, and she wouldn't be able to punish him for it. So, he waited till he was sure that his grandmother had left the house. Then he went downstairs and got a big knife. Grandma made sure there were always sharp knives on the block. He looked at his reflection in the steel blade, and his whole life flashed before his eyes. He was really doing this, wasn't he? There was no going back now. There couldn't be. There was nothing to go back to. While he stood there, he heard his grandma muttering curses as she came back to the house and fear paralyzed him. How could she be back so soon? He was supposed to have at least 45 minutes. He'd planned everything down to the last second. This was not supposed to happen. He stood in his spot, still as a statue, as his grandmother walked in still cursing her old brain as her head darted from left to right. She was searching for something. Where is it? She asked herself. Where's the blasted wallet? Then, as though drawn to him, her eyes caught Myron's, and a look just to his right showed her the wallet. Myron followed her eyes, and he knew in that moment it was over for him. His grandmother narrowed her eyes as she approached him. You're stealing from me, boy. No, no, ma'am, he whispered. But from the way she flinched, he knew the truth wasn't setting him free. He watched as her wrinkled face squeezed into a scowl. You steal my wallet and now you lie? She asked. She wasn't yelling yet, but every word seared Myron's ear like hot venom. On oh, my honor, ma'am, I, I didn't. He was cut short when her hand landed on his face and sent him staggering. The knife fell from his hand. For her age, Myron's grandmother still had a lot of strength in those old bones. Or maybe it was Myron who was too weak. He saw stars and heard bells in his head. But grandma wasn't done yet. She approached him, waving the dreaded wooden spatula like a mad woman. I feed you! She screeched as she hit him with it. I clothe you! I give you clean air to breathe! And this is how you thank me? By stealing from me? I should have let that prostitute of a daughter flush you away when she wanted to. She kept hitting him. I brought her up in the way of the Lord, and this is how she disgraces me. And now this is how you pay me? You are truly your mother's son. 
Myron faltered under the onslaught and blindly reached for the knife. It was now or never. He reached for it with full intent to stab himself, but somehow, he stabbed his grandmother and watched as the shock, then pain, then realization raced across her face. His mind went blank, but his hands seemed to develop a mind of their own. He pulled out the knife and rammed it into her again and again and again and again till there was no hope of her coming back in this life or any other one. He stared at her lifeless form as an unholy peace filled him, a peace he would never have felt if he had killed himself. The dead feel nothing after all. He cocked his head and wondered what the world looked like through the woman's lifeless eyes. It was then that it dawned on him. He had just killed his grandmother. He had just taken a life, a human life, and Myron had never killed anything before. Spiders, ants, nothing. He knew what it was like to be small and have people pick on you just because they can, so he sympathized with smaller insects. He choked on a sob as he felt a wave of fear wash over him. Many things came to his mind at once. He was alone now in the world, and what would happen to him if he were found out? The fear nearly drowned him before his mind snapped like a twig, and he fell back, rolling with laughter. <laughs> He was free, finally, totally free, and he was alive to enjoy it. Never again would anyone pick on him. He might not have strength, speed, or agility, but he had the knife. Feeling inspired, he dragged his grandmother's body out the back door and buried her. Their closest neighbor was a good 15 minutes away, so they were basically alone out here. Just the way grandma liked it. Well, it was just good for Myron. He could carry on about his business in peace. When he was done, he cleaned the house from top to bottom, three times over. Then he had the best nap of his entire life. He called his mother. She always kept in touch with grandma, but she never spoke to him. And knowing the old shrew, he was probably never allowed to. He told her what she had done, and she came to the house that evening. She moved in and assumed her role as his mother never breathing a word of what happened to anyone. They never even talked about it. It was as though it never happened. That, however, could not make up for 16 years of neglect. He killed her eventually and was on his own since then. Now, 18 years later, he'd grown an impressive body count. He worked at the local store which gave him multiple options to pick from. Were better to find elderly women? Once in a while, he went for middle-aged women when the mood struck. All their deaths were quick and messy, just like the first day. He used the same knife, always the same knife. It was the key to getting his freedom and the key to maintaining it. He sat at the table, eating his oatmeal, when he heard a thud on the door. The newspaper boy had brought the newspaper. As always, he waited 10 minutes before he went out to grab it. He knew what he would find on the first page though. He practically wrote the front page news story, so to speak. Over time, he'd come to feel a small thrill at reading about his escapades. Reading about how the police department struggled to find out who he was always gave him a twinge of pride. No one would suspect sweet Myron, and why would they? The town loved him. The second page though, always spoiled his mood. The Black Rock what was it about some stupid piece of rock that always made the papers? He felt like he was running against the damn thing and it was an annoying feeling. He could kill it, even though he mostly killed women. This was one exception he would gladly make. He took a calming breath. There was no way he was jealous of a stupid rock. By the time his 10 minutes were up, he stood up to pick up the paper. But as he opened the door, he froze. He felt the life get sucked out of him and despite the chill outside, he began to sweat. He wanted to close the door and run up the stairs to his room, but he couldn't move. He couldn't move his eyes from the figure just across the street. It was her, not just a lookalike. He could never forget her face, 
You never forgot the face of your first. Not when that face had been a constant nightmare for the first 16 years of your life. Her gait was still the same, even after being dead for more than a decade. The shock of that thought made him slam the door shut, as if it could shut out the image from his head. No, she was dead. Dead and decayed and there was no coming back from that. Convinced, he opened the door again and he didn't see her. He breathed a sigh of relief. He convinced himself that his mind was probably playing tricks on him. Maybe it was time he dropped the knife for a while. Maybe give it up entirely. He picked the paper up and shut the door. As he walked back to the kitchen, he realized the paper felt heavier than normal. The first page was what he expected. A small smile creeping over his face as he read through the article. He flipped open the second page and the smile grew wider. What was this? He'd taken the second page spot too, from the damned rock. Then, he flipped to the third, and his smile quickly turned to a frown. Frantically, he flipped to the fourth and fifth pages. His entire world was spinning out of control. Each page had an article on his past victims, from the most recent to the least, and the newspaper had many more pages than normal. Something was wrong. Something was very wrong. He began to hyperventilate and he tried to calm himself. He always had to be calm or he'd make a mess of things. He staggered to the breakfast table but stopped mid-stride when he saw the table littered with copies of the newspaper. He looked at the copy in his hand, then at the table. Then he closed his eyes and counted to ten. When he opened them again, he saw double the amount on the table and the floor around it. Tremors racked Myron's body from head to toe. What was going on? What was this? He couldn't move. He didn't even know if he should, so he stood where he was. Maybe it was something in the oatmeal, or probably something in the air. None of this could be real. While he was still contemplating, he heard footfalls upstairs, just above his head. He was alone in the house and kept the only key. There was no way anyone else would be in the house this morning. He started toward the staircase when he heard more footfalls. They came from behind him this time. He spun around and landed on his ass as he came face to face with Mrs. Abernathy, the elderly widow of the town plumber. He'd killed her. Her face stared at him like she was seeing through him. Or maybe she wasn't seeing him at all. At this point, Myron Bennett could not be sure of anything anymore. While he still sat there, he caught movement from his left and turned to see as his mother walked in through the living room. He stared at her, and she stared back with the same blank expression as Mrs. Abernathy. Mom? He called out in a shaky voice, but there was no reply. Hi, Mom? He tried again and waved this time, but there wasn't even the slightest move from her. He looked back to Mrs. Abernathy but found that she had been joined by a third guest, a middle-aged woman. He didn't remember this one's name. No, he didn't know it. He never forgot the names of his victims. He remembered that she had gotten into an argument with him at the store, and the store owner, Sam, offered to give the woman a 40% discount on her purchase. Myron had worked for Sam for five years at the time, with stellar behavior, and he was more than a little bit hurt that Sam didn't take his word for it and throw the woman out of the store. Myron had sworn on his life that he would kill her, even if it was the last thing he did. A week later, she turned up dead. Now, she was here in his house, staring at him like he was air. More and more of his victims kept coming out of places that people didn't normally come out of. But then again, this was no normal circumstance. He slowly picked himself up, knowing all too well the dangers of sudden movement when one was held captive. He walked backwards up the stairs, fearing to turn his back on them in case any of his previous victims decided to come after him. He reached the landing, just as the window downstairs broke and he heard someone struggle to come in. Then, the door burst open, admitting more women. His grandmother stood at the head of the group. She pinned him in place with her sharp gray eyes, and he felt fear like never before. He ran to his room, but as he was about to enter, 
He saw another woman standing in front of the window at the end of the hall. The sun coming in behind her made it hard to see her face, but he sure as hell recognized the gown she wore. He'd sold it to her, and it was the one she wore the night he killed her. At the time, Myron thought it was somewhat poetic. Now, however, it was just terrifying. What was worse that the sun cast her shadow on the ground. Ghosts did not have any shadows. He ran into his room and bolted the door. He needed to think. All the women still bore scars from where he had cut them. Their dresses were still torn in the same places, and if they could cast shadows, it meant that the sun didn't just go through them. They were real. How was any of this possible? He heard them running up the stairs, not walking, running. They were coming for him. He double-checked that the door was bolted and locked, then ran for the window. He'd never jumped out of a window before, but he was sure he could make it. If he didn't, at least he lived 18 years longer than he expected to. He opened the window, and the darkness hit him like a fist to the face. One second, it was day, and now, there was darkness darker than any night he'd seen before. It was as if the daylight had been a painting on the window, a mere illusion of the sun. He didn't have time to think too much though. The women were pounding and scratching the door. He remembered what he did to each of them, and he didn't want to know what all of them would do to him. He looked down from the window and saw only an endless abyss. He was looking at the edge of the world. He swallowed hard. What awaited him down there? As if in answer, the door cracked open and one of the women was beside him in a flash. She grabbed him by the neck and flung him outside the window and into the dark below. Myron Bennett was a scared little boy all over again for all eternity. He woke up with a scream and the urge to run, but he found that he couldn't move. He couldn't scream. He could only scream in his mind. No sounds were coming from outside the hospital. When he thought of it, no sounds were coming from within the hospital either. There were no sounds of nurses walking past. No sounds of patients being rolled by. No sound of even the air being stirred by the slightest breeze. The silence was thick and deep. Myron found himself hyperventilating. He would have been greatly relieved if he could hear his gasps, his whimpers, but even those were swallowed up by the silence. Nothingness echoed back at him. The sound, or lack thereof, shattered like thin glass when the door opened and Myron could feel a whisper of hope. Finally, someone was coming to him. That hope was promptly silenced when he saw one of his victims walk into the room. In the place of hope was a vacuum, which was then replaced by crippling fear. The woman just stood there at the door, staring at him, still as a statue. She bore the ghastly scars from where she was slashed by Myron. Her face was all but shredded, but it gave her some kind of underworldly beauty. She took a tentative step forward, as though she was scared that Myron would attack her. It was then that Myron saw the flower cup in her hands. Had it been there, or had it just appeared? She took another step, more confident now no doubt certain that she was no longer at his mercy. She didn't hasten her steps, but neither did she slow. She walked like a bride being led down the aisle to her groom, and it was just as well because she looked like one. Her skin was pale and gave her an ethereal glow. Her hair was loose around her shoulders, and her torn gown flowed around her ankles. The flower in her cupped palms glowed like a lamp, guiding her path through the darkness. The darkness. It was then that Myron realized how dark he had gotten inside the room. The distance between the door and Myron's bed was no more than a few steps, but as the woman approached, it seemed like she truly was walking down a long aisle, and he had the misfortune of being her groom. Eventually, she reached the foot of his bed, and Myron immediately drew his legs up to his chest. She didn't even take a glance at him. She simply laid the flower just at the edge of the bed with the gentleness of a mother laying her child to sleep. He didn't see the woman leave, but he felt another enter. He was the last victim before his first visitor. Ah, 
So this is how it's going to be, he said to the woman who had begun her own march. Just like in the newspaper. There was no answer though, just as he expected. What he didn't expect was for her to hold his gaze in quite the literal sense. Myron couldn't look away, no matter how much he wanted to, no matter how much he tried to. Her white gaze was laser sharp and seared right through his brain. He could feel her pain with every fiber of his being. Painful screams burned in his throat, but he couldn't do or say anything. He was practically being bound and tortured, and there was no means of letting out the pain. Hot sweat ran down his face in rivulets. They burned his back, and Myron begged for the mercy of death. Even he didn't let any of them suffer for this long. The woman dropped her flower, and Myron wondered how it just stood, frozen in place like that. Only when she turned to leave did he feel any relief. It was like nothing happened. But he knew. He knew that he didn't just imagine that torture. The smell of vanilla filled the room. It soothed him, and despite himself, he started to feel at ease. The next woman came in, and her presence expelled every sense of peace or safety within the room. The sweet scent of vanilla was chased out of the window and into the dark, leaving fear and death in its wake. Where the previous woman had borne expressionless faces, this one bore a small smile. It was faint, but Myron noticed. He couldn't relax. He felt even more uneasy than with the first two women. Hatred and revenge radiated from this woman in waves. He could almost see it emanating off her. She held a rose, cupping it at the neck as she sashayed towards him. She reached his bed and stood. Myron stared at her and she stared back. She was mocking him. He didn't know how but he was sure of it. It was also beginning to become clear that he wasn't leaving here the same, if at all. She separated the rose from its stalk, laying the flower like her predecessors and throwing the stalk unceremoniously at his feet. It landed just a hair's breadth from his folded legs. She gave him one last look and turned to leave. Then lighting broke through Myron's mind and shocked his very being. Memories ran through him like glass shards, scratching him. He opened his mouth to release a blood-curdling scream, but the sound was swallowed by the silence. His body jerked backward, and his back arched with the intensity of the pain. He tasted blood in his throat. He felt like he was being flayed as horrible tremors racked his body, and there was no one to help him. There was fear, and there was pain, and at that moment, Myron Bennett felt both in their purest forms. Like the others, this one ceased abruptly and Myron's body collapsed on the bed just as another woman was entering the room. Although everything lasted for less than a minute, Myron didn't know how much more of this he could take. More women came and dropped their flowers, inflicting their own forms of torture in varying degrees. What's worse, Itch took the light with them as they left, leaving Myron in an ever-increasing darkness. At some point, even their glow was buried in obscurity, and all he was left with was the faint echo of their bare feet slapping the ground. It was unnerving, to say the least. He kept wondering what would happen when the last one left, and with so many years worth of victims, he was left to wonder and suffer for a long time. He wanted to beg for mercy. Forgiveness was a luxury he didn't even have the illusion of, but death was well deserved. They could kill him now, and never have to see his face again. He deserved that much. But it seemed like, here, wherever it was, only the dead could make any sound. Quite inconvenient, seeing that he needed to talk to get them to consider killing him. They never spoke to him. Not one of them said a single word, and any sound he made was muffled by the silence. The darkness grew until he could literally feel it, like a living, breathing being around him. He could hardly see his hands if he held them up in front of him. All his senses were alert now, even though he was fast losing his sense of direction. The footsteps seemed to be coming from different directions now. Then, they stopped altogether as the last woman left the door, leaving him locked in a chain of flowers around his bed. There was a stillness, but not quite as absolute as before. 
there was something in the air. A hum of some sort. It wasn't a sound Myron could pick up with his ears. He just felt it. The hairs on his body stood in dread. Something was coming. Something dark. Whatever it was, it was not of this world. It was by far worse than anything Myron's broken mind had conceived or suffered. How Myron knew this, he didn't know. But he knew things were about to get very bad. He heard laughter coming from somewhere beyond his room. It could have been in the same room for all he knew, even though it sounded distant. It started as a girly giggle, then grew into the laughter of a woman. It was a rich laugh, thick as honey and just as sweet to the ears. Then it morphed into a bitter sneer. Whoever this person was, they were laughing at him. He couldn't blame them though. He'd brought this upon himself. He'd butchered them and let them die. Myron held his breath as the laughter continued. No, it couldn't be. He had to convince himself that it couldn't be for the sake of his sanity. But it was. He could never forget the voice, no matter how many lives he lived. It was his grandmother's. She was the one laughing at him. He listened as she laughed at him to scorn. She must be enjoying this. And why wouldn't she? Just as Myron contemplated all the reasons why his grandmother should be happy at his situation, he felt a presence in the room. It wasn't just the darkness growing thicker. This was a living, breathing thing. It filled out the room and Myron had to shrink into himself. He could feel its hunger. He could feel it taunting him in his mind. At this point, he couldn't even put up a fight. The women had wrung out the last bit of resistance from him and left him vulnerable. Through the darkness, he got a glimpse of its face. He shut his eyes and tried to clear his head, but the image was burnt in his mind. Myron willed his body to move, to get up and run as far as he could from here. Anywhere would be safe as long as it wasn't here with this being. His body started to respond. He started to feel hope again. The first thing he thought of was his knife. It had been his lifelong companion, but any knife would do at this point. He could just get his knife. He had a chance to escape this place. The darkness was rolling back, and he could finally take a good look at this thing. All his hopes vanished in a silent scream. It was huge. So huge. It was above him. Below him. Around him. And it had more mouths than all the stars in all the galaxies combined. It was hard for his mind to fathom a being this big. What are you? Myron thought and it answered, speaking straight to his mind. Your end, Myron. A tear fell from his face and froze just beneath his eyes. He felt his mind being taken away from him, even before his body was consumed.